Nice to see you. Middle after a long time. Yes, Arun. How are you? I'm fine. All well in Kolkata. Not <laughs> all well. Sudha, I Sudha, can you hear me? I need your number, your mobile number. So I'll I'll want it at some. I'll I'll ask you for it. Friends, we are waiting for Professor Amir Bagchi to join in. I request you to uh, please bear with us. Hello, Maha. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here, especially those in uh, Delhi and North India, where it's so very cold. Uh, we are here on time, but we will just wait for. a few minutes uh, and professor bagchi is trying to join in thanks sure
I apologize for the delay in beginning this program. Uh, we were waiting for Professor Amir Bagchi, but perhaps because of some um, urgent reasons or perhaps connectivity issues, he is unable to join in immediately, uh, and we are not able to get through to him. So I think we will begin with the proceedings, and uh, when he joins us, he uh, may say a few words at the end of the program. Professor Amir Kumar Bagchi, uh, the General President of the Indian History Congress, Professor Keshavan Veluka, General President Elect for the 81st session of the Indian History Congress, Professor Mridula Mukherjee, one of the most eminent historians of modern India, members of the Executive Committee of the IHC, sectional presidents for the 81st session of the Indian History Congress, members of the general body of the IHC, students and friends. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the online events of the Indian History Congress that will be held today and tomorrow, the 28th and 29th of December 2020. We have seen an unprecedented situation in the country and across the world as a result of the pandemic caused by the COVID-19 virus, which has affected the movement of people and goods, the global economy and our everyday lives, and resulted in an unprecedented lockdown across the world. Under these circumstances, it was with great regret that the office bearers and the EC of the IHC took the decision to postpone the scheduled annual session generally held from 28th to 30th December 2020. Our members would know that this is an unprecedented event in the annals of the IHC as the only times when the sessions were not held were in times of grave national calamity um, such as in 1935, between 1935 and 38, in 1942, 1962 and 1971. There have been several occasions when the Congress session was not held as scheduled, but at a later date. The most recent instance being the 79th session, which was to be held in Pune and was cancelled by the local hosts with barely a few weeks to go before the event. This session was then held in February 2019 in Bhopal under the aegis of the Barkatullah University. We earnestly hope that now that a vaccine for the coronavirus has been rolled out in some countries and is set to reach India soon, it is only a matter of time before we can start planning for the 81st session in the new year. Sometime in early November, we received a suggestion from some of our EC members and senior colleagues to hold an online event in the form of a webinar in view of the exceptional circumstances that we find ourselves in. suggested that perhaps we could organize the prestigious Professor S.C. Mishra Memorial Lecture as part of this online program. Although instituted only 30, this endowed lecture has become a landmark event at the IHC, generally convened on the evening of the first day of the annual session. We decided to begin our online event with this memorial lecture, and it is my pleasure and privilege to invite you to it. Professor S.C. Mishra, in whose memory the lectures have been instituted by a generous gift from Mrs. Nirmala Mishra, was an eminent historian and served as president of the Indian History Congress in 1981. He was professor and head of the Department of History, Maharaja Syaji Rao University, Baroda, until his untimely death in 1984. Professor Mishra was a product of the renowned Allahabad School, his PhD thesis on Sher Shah having been submitted to the Allahabad University. Upon his appointment at the MS University, Baroda, he endeavored successfully to establish a strong center of research in medieval history with special attention paid to Gujarat. The in Gujarat, published in 1964, reflected Mishra's espousal of a critical and sociological approach. This is only the beginning of a two-decade-long dedicated scholarship on the medieval history of Gujarat. Satish Chandra, R.S. Sharma, A.R. Kulkarni, Irfan Habib, Borunde, Anirudhare, J.V. Nayak, B.N. Mukherjee, Shireen Musli, Aditya Mukherjee, and N. Ram are among the luminaries who have delivered the Professor S.C. Mishra Memorial Lecture in previous years. 
Today, we have eminent historian Professor Mridula Mukherjee, formerly with the Center for Historical Studies, JNU, who will be delivering the Professor S.C. Mishra Memorial Lecture. The topic she has chosen to speak on is Punjab Kisan Protest, a legacy of heroic non-violent resistance. Since uh, Professor Bhakti is not here, uh, and he was to say a few words of welcome and introduce our speakers, uh, let me go ahead and uh, do that on his behalf. Uh, we have as the chair of this session, Professor Keshavan Velukat, the president for the 81st se session that would have commenced today if things had gone as planned. Professor Keshan Velusat is Professor of History, retired from the Department of History, University of Delhi. He has been visiting Professor at several places, including at JNU, New Delhi. Uh, in 2008, he completed a major research project on the historical atlas of South India. He has been sectional president, Ancient India, uh, of the Indian History Congress. He has authored several books, amongst which Brahmin's Uh, my feeling of honor is all the stronger because Professor Murugana Mukherjee, who is giving this lecture this morning, is my own teacher. She has, as always, chosen a most appropriate theme for her lecture, Punjab Kisan Protests, a legacy of heroic, nonviolent resistance. In the present context, when protests of uh, peasants from Punjab are showing what real resistance is. When that is threatening a regime that seeks to offer our economy in a platter to the corporates, there cannot be a better theme on which a concerned historian can speak. Those in the corridors of power who have had little experience of and less knowledge about India's struggle for freedom will do well to take a lesson or two from such episodes in the past of which Professor Mukherjee is going to speak. We in the Indian History Congress have always raised our voice against blatant violations of democratic values and I must even at the expense of being less than modest, congratulate my teacher for choosing this most appropriate theme for her lecture. With these words, I request Professor Mukherjee to deliver uh, the lecture. Professor Mukherjee. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Keshavan. I'm very grateful to the Indian History Congress for giving me this uh, honor in this very unusual session. Those of us old timers at the Indian History Congress know how we would all flock in the evening to hear the SC Mishra Memorial Lecture. And now to be delivering this in this uh, very different format is, of course, a bit strange. But I think it's still something uh, very good that we are managing to do this and we are managing to reach uh, so many people in these tough times, I'm sure it will bring some cheer and some sense of purpose to our otherwise slightly lonely and isolated lives. It gives us at least a chance to see each other, <laughs> see your faces on the screens, hear your voices. And that itself, I think, gives a sense of comradeship, which I value very much, which is, I think, what the Indian History Congress is all about. Uh, that's why we go there every year to, uh, you know, uh, be part of uh, something bigger, be part of something important, to meet friends, to meet comrades, to meet comrades in arms with whom we've been fighting many battles over the years. So I'm really very grateful for this opportunity. 
uh, which the Indian History Congress and particularly to the General Secretary uh, Mahalakshmi who invited me for this. I'm very grateful to Keshavan for chairing this. I hope we will be able to see Professor Bhakti uh, join us uh, uh, some, at some point in this uh, lecture. So um, let me then get ahead with uh, the subject uh, of my, uh, uh, the purpose of my being here today. I'm just going to uh, take half a second to just get my lecture onto the screen. Yeah. So as you know, the topic uh, of my talk is Punjab Kisan Protests, Legacy of Heroic Nonviolent Struggle. As I speak, the Kisans of Punjab, as well as other parts of India, are engaged in what they see as a life and death struggle with the government of India. For them, it is a struggle not only for MSP or for Mandis, but to save their very identity as Kisans. What they anticipate and fear is the loss of a whole way of life, of their world, which is intimately linked up with their land and the labor they have put into it. Is there any problem? No. The rosy prospect offered to them by government of becoming contract farmers of big private companies on their own land taking orders about what to grow, how to grow, which fertilizers and which insecticides to use, selling to them at dictated prices does not allure them. What they see in the future is the tentacles of these private players closing in on them and reducing them to tenants and workers on their own land. And for them, that is worse than death, which is why they are willing to fight on despite heavy odds which is why the women and the youth and the children are out there in the cold. They see their future dissolving into an abyss. Observers are frequently surprised by the calm determination and firm resolve of the protesters. Where does it emanate from? They are also surprised by the sophistication of the Kisan unions and, the, and their clarity of purpose and capacity to organize. They might be less surprised if they knew something about the history of Kisan protest in the Punjab. The fault is not theirs alone, as the Punjab story has been mostly ignored or underplayed in the recounting of Kisan protest in colonial India. The focus has been on Gujarat, Bardoli and Kheda, on Bihar, Champaran and Swami Sajanand, Bengal, Tibaga movement, Andhra, NG Ranga and then the Telangana armed struggle, to some extent Kerala, the Karshaka Sangha movement. Punjab, even though it had a strong tradition of peasant protest, along with the UP and Maharashtra and Assam, has received much less attention. Many years ago, I tried to set the record straight for Punjab by researching and writing the history of peasant protest in the first half of the 20th century. Not many were interested in my effort. By then, peasants were out of fashion with historians and other social scientists, possibly because they were not subaltern enough, and with policymakers, perhaps because they were not an immediate threat or concern, as agrarian unrest of all kinds had been on the decline since the 1970s and 80s. But since last month, when Punjab Kisans with their colorful turbans and noisy tractors and trolleys and plentiful langars have parked themselves on the borders of the national capital, waiting to be let in, my fortunes have revived. And even the Indian History Congress, the august body of Indian historians, happily accepted my proposal for the topic of the SC Mishra lecture. I doubt that I would have got away with talking about this outmoded subject last year. But that is how contemporary history is. The present can jolt us into looking at our past 
in ways that we cannot predict. So I begin by acknowledging my debt to the Kisans of Punjab who have revived this interest in my old fashioned style of history. As I began to prepare this talk, I was myself surprised by the extraordinary way in which this current protest resonates with the past that I'm going to talk about. I will demonstrate to you how the great grandparents and grandparents and even parents of some of the older participants fought against government legislation that they did not like, how they were supported by their family members who had gone abroad to labor. Then the British government even did not call it foreign funding. How those who had gone abroad were imbued with a strong sense of identity with their motherland. How they set examples of non-violent heroism in the Akali movement, which were acknowledged by Gandhiji himself and only matched by the Dharasana Satyagrahis. How Kisan unions were organized from the village upwards. How sharecroppers revolted against private companies who leased the land from the government and so on. How women were part of the struggle, including at the leadership level. How intellectually sophisticated the movement was. What kind of intellectual support it had. A mature leadership willing to make tremendous sacrifices. How newspapers, even mainstream ones such as the Tribune, played a great role in the building up of this protest. In this lecture, I will attempt to show how beginning in 1907 with the Swadeshi movement, the movement, as it was popularly called in the Punjab, the tradition of peasant or Kisan protest was strengthened by the Ghadar movement of 1914, by the Akali movement from 1920 to 2020, by the activities of the Kisan party and Bharat Sabha founded by Bhagat Singh in the late 20s, the major national struggles such as the civil disobedience movement of 1930 to 32, the Kisan Sabha movement of peasants against high land revenue and water rates and against indebtedness during the years 31 to 36, of sharecroppers against exorbitant rent demands of private companies and landlords in 1938-39 in the Nilibar and Montgomery Canal colonies, of the peasants of Amritsar and Lahore in the Uche Pulda Murcha and Lahore Kisan Murcha against attempts to enhance revenue in new settlements in 38 and 39, the Muzara or tenants movement in Patiala from 37 to 53, the anti-war and the individual civil disobedience movement from 39 to 41, the Quit India movement in 1942, the Harsha China Murcha and the pro-INA soldiers movement in the post-war years. Just this list which I have read out to you should begin to convince you of the strength of this tradition. I also demonstrate that we have to take into account the role not only of the Indian National Congress and the Akalis, but also of left-wing groups and parties such as the Kirtis, Communists, Bhagat Singh and Nojawan Bharat Sabha, of the Congress Socialists and of individuals. Uh, who, who were of left-wing uh, uh, inclinations such as uh, uh, Professor Bridge Narayan, BPL Bedi, Munshi Ahmed Deen, etc. There would of course be regional variations in this picture with the greater strength of the movement being visible in the central districts, most of which constitute present-day Indian Punjab, followed by the southeastern Punjab, which is Haryana today. Much of western Punjab, which went to Pakistan, home to a very backward, rack-rented tenant population dominated by big feudal landlords remained outside the influence of modern politics itself. I begin with the Swadeshi movement of, uh, of 1905 to 1907. The origins of the tradition of what I have called heroic non-violent resistance in Punjab can be traced back to the Pagri Sambhalo Jatta movement of 1907, which the British referred to as the Punjab disturbances, which were part of the Swadeshi movement. The Swadeshi movement, as you all know, began as a protest against the partition of Bengal in 1905, but soon spread to other parts of the country. It was particularly strong in Bombay and Punjab. 
In Punjab, the movement went beyond urban confines and linked up with a strong rural protest that was building up due to government measures. The most important of these was the Punjab Land Colonization Bill introduced in the Punjab Council on 25th October 1906, which sought to drastically change the conditions on which land was granted to colonists in the canal colonies of the Punjab. In addition, the government also ordered a sharp enhancement in the canal water rates on the Badidwab Canal, which irrigated the districts of Amritsar, Gurdaspur, and Lahore. The average increase itself was 25%, but on special crops as high as 50%. Simultaneously, there was a sharp increase in the land revenue of Rawalpandi district as a result of a new settlement. Very interesting, again, three government measures, just as we now have these three bills, were then at the heart of the troubles. The initial lead was taken by some landowners belonging to the Bar Zamindar Association, many of whom were even who were local lawyers, and by the Zamindar newspaper edited by Sirajuddin, at which which, all, which uh, called for organizing mass meetings at which resolutions condemning the bill and advocating refusal to pay the fines were passed. The numbers attending these meetings grew rapidly, and a meeting held at Lailpur on 3rd February 1907 was attended by 10,000 people. Agitation intensified further in March, and a new element was added by the participation of nationalist leaders and activists from Lahore, such as Lala Lajpat Rai and Ajit Singh, the uncle of Bhagat Singh, who contributed to the movement by sharpening its political focus and by popularizing its demands outside the colony areas, and thus garnering much-needed support from the urban and rural population of the province as a whole. From April onwards, especially through the efforts of Sajid Singh, the peasants of Amritsar and Lahore also began to voice their protests against the enhanced water rates on the Baridwab Canal through mass meetings and resolves to pay the new, refuse to pay the new rates. It is also... Uh, they uh, sorry. Uh, meetings were marked by their sharp anti-government tone, by their appeals for maintenance of communal unity, and by appeal to the peasants to stand up for their rights, to protect their self-respect. The movement is also therefore popularly known by the opening line of the poem that became its symbol and was first recited at a mass gathering in March 1907 in Lyalpur. Pagri Sambhalo Jatta. O peasant, protect your self-respect. The Pagri is a sign of your self-respect. A marked feature of the meetings was the participation of Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs and the complete absence of any communal divide. By the beginning of May, the government of Punjab, probably a little smarter than the ones we have around now, was in a panic. A riot in Rawalpindi town on the occasion of the arrest of three leaders who had organized a public meeting to protest against the increase in water rates and in land revenue and municipal taxes in Rawalpindi strengthened the government's growing conviction that the whole movement was being organized by urban nationalist agitators as part of a conspiracy to overthrow the government. Read Urban Naxals. Reports of the disaffection spreading among soldiers and ex-soldiers further contributed to the alarmist actors as part of a conspiracy to overthrow the government. Read Urban Naxals. Reports of the disaffection spreading among soldiers and ex-soldiers further contributed to the alarmist atmosphere and repression began in earnest. Lajpat Rai and Ajit Singh, who were considered the chief enacted in 1912, was free of almost all the objections raised to its precursor of 1906. I have presented with you a template of possible action by the government today. The agitation of 1907 demonstrated that the proverbial loyalty of the Punjabi peasants, a loyalty that was essential if the peasant communities were to continue to be designated as martial races, from which a major component of the British Indian Army was recruited could no longer be taken for granted. It was Ajit Singh, the uncle of Bhagat Singh, the man who was the most active in trying to integrate the various sectors of the 1907 agitation and to give it a sharp political edge, who became the hero and the symbol of 1907. This link that was forged between the assertive nationalism found in the towns and the peasants' struggle for their rights in 1907 
continued to inspire later generations of political activists who in turn ensured that the experience of 1907 remained alive in popular memory as a symbol of heroic, non-violent peasant protest and secular nationalism. We next come to the Gadar movement. This most important movement that was to have a far-reaching impact on the peasants of Punjab, even though it was not a peasant movement. This movement was started in, it was, uh, the, the years in which it was uh, strongest was, in, it originated among Indian immigrants on the west coast of North America, the vast majority of whom were from the small holding Sikh peasant families of central Punjab but also included Indian students and political exiles living in the USA. The same is the picture today. Most of those who labor abroad from the Punjab are from the small holding Sikh peasant families of central Punjab. It got its name from a weekly paper, the Gadar, that was brought out from November 1913 by a group of political activists led by Lala Hardayal, a Hindu, an Indian revolutionary who was in political exile. The paper obviously answered a very deeply felt need among the immigrant Indian communities and was avidly read not only in North America, but also in the Philippines, in the Malay states, in China, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Burma, in Trinidad, in the Honduras. At some places, people gathered together regularly to read, discuss and debate the issues raised by the paper and recite the poems it carried. On the front page of each issue was a feature titled, titled Angrezi Raj Ka Kacha Chitta, or an expose of British rule. And this consisted of 14 points enumerating the harmful effects of British rule, including the drain of wealth, the low per capita income of Indians, the high land tax, etc., etc. In sum, the entire critique of British rule that had been formulated by the Indian National Movement was summarized and presented every week to the Gadar readers. The last two points of the Chitha suggested the solution. The Indian population numbers seven crores in the Indian states and 24 crores in British India, while there are only 79,614 officers and soldiers. Uh, and 38,948 volunteers who are Englishmen. Number two, 56 years have lapsed since the revolt of 1857. Now there is an urgent need for a second one. But perhaps the most powerful impact was made by the poems that appeared in the Gadar, soon collected and published as Gadar di Gunj and distributed free of cost. These poems were marked as much by their secular tone as by their revolutionary zeal. The Gadar succeeded in a very brief time in changing the self-image of the Punjabi immigrant from that of a loyal soldier of the British Raj to that of a rebel whose only aim was to destroy the British hold on his motherland. It consciously made the Punjabi aware of his loyalist past, made him feel ashamed of it and challenged him to atone for it in the name of his earlier tradition of resistance to oppression. While the Gadar was busy spreading the message of revolts, the events surrounding the fateful voyage of the ship Komagata Maru further inflamed immigrant passions. The outbreak of the First World War had also placed the Gadar leaders in a dilemma. This was the opportunity they had been waiting for, since it was obvious that the best time for a revolt in India was when the British had their hands full with the war, but they were not yet quite ready. Their organization in India was almost non-existent and they had no arms. Despite these limitations, however, the Gadar leadership gave the call for a war on the British. Indians abroad were asked to return home. And the remarkable fact was that 8,000 Indians actually heeded the call and returned home. And the vast majority of these were Punjabi Sikhs. However, tragically, the government of India was much better prepared and systematically intercepted the returning immigrants separated the dangerous ones, interned them, restricted their movements. And the few who were able to escape tried to go around the Punjab and build up discontent over there, even tried in the cantonments, they tried the soldiers. But the situation in Punjab actually was not conducive to the building up of a revolt, which is a different story. 
But the government then came in with a very heavy hand. And this is uh, where the whole point of tradition of resistance comes in. The British succeeded in penetrating the organization and most of the leaders were arrested and severe repression launched. 45 of the Gadar revolutionaries were hanged and 200 others were sent to what was Kalapani or long years of imprisonment, mostly in the Andamans. Should we therefore conclude that the Gadarites fought in vain because they could not drive out the British, their movement was a failure? These conclusions are not necessarily correct because the success or failure of a political movement is not always to be measured in terms of its achievement of stated objectives. By that measure, all the major national struggles, whether of 1920, 22, 30, 34 or 42, would have to be classified as failures since none of them culminated in Indian independence. But if the success and failure are to be measured in terms of the deepening of nationalist consciousness, the evolution and testing of new strategies and methods of struggle, the creation of traditions of resistance, of secularism, of democracy, of egalitarianism, then the Gadarites certainly contributed more than their share to the struggle for freedom. Ironic though it may seem, it was in the realm of ideology that the Gadar success was the greatest. This, the, the, the uh, I'm sorry. The entire nationalist critique of colonialism, which was the most solid and abiding contribution of the moderate nationalists, was carried in a powerful and simple form to the mass of Indian immigrants, most of whom were poor workers and agricultural laborers. This propaganda effort motivated and educated an entire generation. Though a majority of the leaders of the Gadar movement and most of the participants were drawn from among the six, the ideology that was created and spread through the Gadar and Gadar Digunj was strongly secular in tone. This too is very important for the future uh, course of the uh, peasant movement in Punjab. Concern with religion was seen as petty and narrow-minded and unworthy of revolutionaries. That this was not mere brave talk is seen by the ease with which leaders belonging to different religions and regions were accepted by the movement. Lala Hardial was a Hindu, so was Ramchandra, other major leader, and many others. Uh, for example, Barkatullah was a Muslim, Rash Bihari Bose, a Hindu and a Bengali. Further, the nationalist salute Bande Matram and not any Sikh religious greeting was urged upon and adopted as the rallying cry of the Gadar movement. They sought to give a new meaning to religion as well. They urged that religion lay not in observing the outward form, such as those signified by long hair and kirpan, but in remaining true to the model of good behavior that was enjoined by all religious teachings. Far from dwelling on the greatness of Sikhs or the Punjabis, the Gadars constantly criticized the loyalist role played by the Punjabis during 1857, as I have already uh, mentioned. In the words, in the words of Sohan Singh Bhakna, who later became a major peasant and communist leader, I quote him. He said, we were not Sikhs or Punjabis. Our religion was patriotism. Another marked feature of Gadar ideology, which was also very important uh, for the later developments, was its democratic and egalitarian content. Deeply influenced as he was by anarchist and syndicalist movements and even by socialist ideas, Hardeyal imparted to the movement an egalitarian ideology. Perhaps this is what facilitated the transformation of many Gadarites into peasant leaders and communists in the 1920s and 30s. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the communist and peasant movement in Punjab was really built by the Gadarites. Hardyal's other major contribution was the creation of a truly internationalist outlook among the Gadar revolutionaries. His lectures and articles were full of references to Irish, Mexican and Russian revolutionaries. He referred to the Mexican revolutionaries as Mexican Gadarites. Therefore, the Gadar activists were distinguished by their secular, egalitarian, democratic and non-chauvinistic internationalist outlook.
And as I just said, in the late 1920s and 30s, the surviving Gadarites helped lay the foundations of a secular nationalist and peasant movement in India. We now turn very briefly to the Akali movement, uh, which was there from 1920 to 1925. This movement, the Akali movement, or the movement for reform of the Sikh shrines or Gurdwaras, was of profound significance as it was the harbinger of a democratic, anti-feudal and anti-imperialist consciousness among the vast mass of the Sikh peasantry of central Punjab. Its central aim that Gurdwaras must be managed by popularly elected representatives of the Sikhs and not by the corrupt feudal style Mahants or priests or by the government or its representatives, though obviously religious in form, had a clear democratic and anti-feudal message. And as the struggle developed and the British lined up behind the loyalist priests, the anti-imperialist focus of the movement also grew sharper. The growing anger against the Mahants among the Sikh nationalists and reformers came to a boiling point first when the priests of the Golden Temple at Amritsar declared the Gadar revolutionaries as fallen Sikhs or renegades, and then when they specially honored the notorious General Dyer, who was responsible for the Jallianwala Bagh massacre of 1919, and even declared him an honorary Sikh. The movement began in 1920 with the organization of jathas or groups of volunteers whose task was to liberate the Gurdwaras from the control of the Mahants and government appointed managers. If I may just stop for a moment and say the begin, this is the beginning of the jathas, a form of organization and then uh, of struggle, which then became very common in the Indian freedom struggle. The government had not yet decided on a clear policy, nor was it aware of the potential strength of the movement. Consequently, not willing to alienate the reformers at this stage, it allowed the control of many Gurdwaras to fall into the hands of reformers. Encouraged by this e easy success, the movement surged forward. The Mahant of the Gurdwara at Nankana, which is Guru Nanak's birthplace, however, had different ideas. When a Jatha of Akali volunteers entered the Gurdwara on 21st February 1921 to pray, he ordered his band of 500 armed mercenaries to open fire and attack the Jatha. Nearly 100 Akalis were killed in the process, and the incident immediately attracted nationwide attention. The Akalis succeeded in wresting control of the Gurdwara by continuing to send Jathas, but the experience had transformed the perceptions of the nature of the struggle. After this, the Akali movement moved closer to the ongoing non-cooperation movement and not only adopted many of its programs, such as boycott of British goods and liquor and setting up of panchayats, but also accepted its total emphasis on non-violence. And it is in this next incident that this display of non-violence in a pristine form comes to the fore. In August 1922, this is the Guru ka, famous Guru Kabag Murcha, a confrontation developed between the Akalis and the Mahant of Guru Kabag Gurdwara near Amritsar over control of lands attached to the Gurdwara. The Akalis, who had already gained control of the Gurdwara, cut some firewood from the disputed land. The Mahant reported a theft to the police, who promptly came and arrested the Akalis and put them on trial. At this, Jathas began to arrive and cut trees from the disputed land. The government arrested 4,000 Akalis, <coughs> then suddenly changed track and decided to order beating up of the Jathas with Lathis. In subsequent days, Guru Kabag Murcha was witness to the most harrowing scenes of police brutality and the most heroic examples of nonviolent resistance. Countrywide condemnation followed and the government was again forced to retreat. Another big struggle took place at Jaito in Nabha, in which even Jawaharlal Nehru was paraded with handcuffs in the streets and then spent a few weeks in Nabha jail in the most unsanitary conditions. The movement, Akali movement, culminated in the passing of the Gurdwara Reform Act in 1925, which gave control over the Gurdwaras to an elected body. Thus, the Akali movement had succeeded in mobilizing a broad front of all sections of Sikhs, urban as well as rural, as well as in gaining the sympathy and at times even participation of other religious groups such as Hindus and Muslims. 
Nevertheless, it is beyond doubt that its main base was among the Sikh peasantry of Punjab, including the princely states. The scale of this mobilization was remarkable indeed. All told, about 30,000 went to jail. And of these, the vast majority were peasants, which is why this is so important for our story. An estimate made of the strength of the Akali Jathas in early 1922 placed the total number, excluding the princely states and southwest and southeast Punjab, at 15,506, of whom 10,200 were Jats, and another 2,399 were from the non-landowning artisan and labouring castes. Besides these activists, there were obviously thousands who participated by feeding the Jathas, making other contributions, attending meetings and the like. The main strength of the movement was again in the central districts, Lahore, Amritsar, Shekhupura, Gurdaspur, Jalandhar uh, and Lalpur, but also in the princely states of Kapurthala, Patiala and Nabha. The significance of the politicization achieved by the Akali movement becomes immediately apparent when we find that it is this area that was to remain the main base of the subsequent national and peasant struggles as well. The struggles for the reform of the Gurdwaras thus performed for the Sikh peasantry the task that was performed for most other regions of the country by the non-cooperation movement. That is the task of awakening them to modern democratic and nationalist consciousness and organization. If you will do an analysis of those who are participating in the movement today, you will again find that they are coming from the same regions. I now come to another aspect, which is the which, which gives a different turn to peasant protest in Punjab, which is the emergence of left wing groups and parties. This tradition of protest in Punjab received a big boost with the emergence of left-wing groups and parties which were ideologically strongly anti-imperialist and staunchly secular, as well as being socialist. As elsewhere in the country, the 1920s were witness to the emergence of new left-wing ideological currents in Punjab, largely under the influence of the Russian Revolution, which fired the imagination of many young nationalists by opening up new vistas of human liberation. On 12th April 1928, the Kirti Kisan party, party was founded in Amritsar. And this emergence of the Kirti Kisan party also coincided with the revival of the Naujawan Bharat Sabha, originally founded in Lahore in 1926 by a group of radical youth led by Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev, Bhagwati Charan Vora and Ram Kishan, influenced by the revolutionary movement led by the Hindustan Republican Association as a forum for the mass organization of youth. This impact of this trend was to be uh, seen very soon in the uh, forthcoming anti-Simon Commission protest. After the lull following the end of the non-cooperation and Akali movements, nationalist political activity re-emerged with the announcement of the all-white Simon Commission in November 1927. It led to new efforts at unity, and though these were quite successful, the time for organization was short, and the countrywide boycott announced for 3rd February 1928, the day Simon set foot on Indian soil, met with a relatively lukewarm response in the province. But later in the year, when the Simon Commission reached Lahore, a very successful demonstration was organized on 30th October with Lala Lajpatrai at its head. A vicious lati charge by the police on the demonstration led to injuries to many of the senior leaders, and Lala Lajpatrai succumbed to these on the 17th of November. This led to a mass outrage, and his death was avenged by Bhagat Singh and his comrades of the Naujawan Bharat Sabha, a youth organization whose members had earlier denounced Lajpatrai in the strongest terms for his communal outlook. They shot dead on December 17th, the white police official they suspected had been responsible for Lajpatrai's death. A new atmosphere, reflective of a new wave of struggle, had been born, and throughout 1929, nationalist feeling was on the, uh, on the upspun. The significance of this event, of Bhagat Singh's uh, involvement in this act, his subsequent arrest, his subsequent trial, and subsequent hanging, and the impact of that, of course, on the politics of Punjab, but even on the politics of India, we all know was very significant. Therefore, I've particularly made a mention of this here today so that I can link it up later with the broader movement that is going on.
The Lahore session of the Indian National Congress took place in the last week of the year 1929. And it declared complete independence as the aim of the Congress and also resolved upon a movement of civil disobedience to be launched shortly. <coughs> the tone of the new stage was reflected in Jawaharlal Nehru's declaration in his presidential address to the Lahore Congress. I must frankly confess that I am a socialist and a Republican and I'm no believer in kings and princes or in the order which produces the modern kings of industry who have greater power over the lives and fortunes of men than even the kings of old, and whose methods are as, as predatory as those of the old feudal aristocracy. This, as I said, set the tone for what was to follow. A militancy and egalitarian outlook, emphasis on the struggles of workers and peasants, all this is what then comes to the fore in the following years. The decision at Lahore that a mass campaign of civil disobedience would soon be inaugurated immediately resulted in a flurry of activity all over the province and the rural areas were soon al alive with a whole variety of agitations and mobilization. The Naujawan Bharat Sabha and the Kirti Kisan Party, who I have just mentioned, were very active in this, of course, along with the Congress. What, what uh, the, the other fe common feature which strikes one sharply again at this time is the secular tone of all the propaganda and the absence of any appeals to religious sentiment. This was as true of leftists as it was of the non-leftists. In fact, the necessity of communal amity and of special efforts to get Muslims to participate in the movement was invariably stressed. I would now briefly like to talk about a campaign of non-payment of land revenue, which was started at this time, and because this had a very powerful impact on the peasantry of the province and radicalized them uh, to a very great extent. On 15th May 1930, the Congress Working Committee gave permission to the PCCs to begin the campaign of non-payment of land revenue wherever they thought fit. This immediately led in Punjab to an intensification of activity connected with encouraging the non-payment of land revenue. By the end of May, the situation on this front was serious enough for the Punjab government to ask for the extension of the ordinance, which granted powers to arrest and prosecute those who incited others not to pay taxes. And then these powers were freely used to arrest those involved in promoting the campaign. In all, 800 persons were prosecuted under this ordinance alone, of which 737 were actually convicted. And mind you, these arrests were only of those who were instigating, not of those who were not paying the tax. So the number of activists who were picked up with a very short period of uh, time, bet between the middle of May and uh, uh, middle of July, was 800. In fact, uh, it seemed that, uh, that the chances of this movement taking off were so high uh, that the government was actually very frightened. But that is why it took such firm action and such repressive action. And actually then it succeeded in nipping the movement before it actually reached the stage of mass refusal to pay taxes. However, the civil disobedience movement, the no tax uh, campaign, produced a generalized anti-British sentiment among the Kisans, which also spilled over in the form of an anti-loyalist sentiment. And here to give you an idea of the atmosphere of the times in the rural areas among the Kisans, I will quote to you from a report of an army officer who conducted a special tour in the rural areas of the districts of Jhang, Lailpur, Shekhupura, Gujrawala, Gurdaspur, and Lahore between early May and mid-June 1930, peak period of the civil disobedience movement. I quote, he says, a salam is becoming comparatively rare along the main roads. Small collections of people in bus stops, at railway stations, and in the outskirts of villages on seeing isolated military officers at once chorus in clubs in Dabad, both old and young. The fate of the older, the fate of the older 
the old soldier and other loyalists in many villages is deplorable and elicits by deep sympathy. They cannot worship except in khadar clothing. Their fields are garnered with difficulty. Their laborers are cleared off by Congress agents. Their family cannot leave their houses without molestation, even for purposes of nature. They are not allowed to draw water at the village wells, nor will the Congress agents allow the village banyas to supply them. They are insulted at every turn and generally life is a burden. Why they remain loyal is a mystery to me. In addition, water does not reach their fields. In some of the villages, loyal men go armed with escorts and are in daily fear of limb or even life. This applies also to loyal Lombardars whose loyalty is trained most unfairly. What a description of a province which was supposed to be the home of the martial races. Such was the impact of these movements. Another illustration of the new spirit abroad was the refusal of villagers to continue to perform begar. Begar was giving free supplies to officials who were on tour or came to actually repress you or to arrest you. You were still supposed to give them free supplies. A refusal which led to serious clashes in a number of cases. One such heroic village was Jhamang in the district of Lahore. It was a village with a mixed Hindu, Muslim and Sikh population in which the Congress had been active for the last eight or nine years. Since April 30, activities were intensified once it became known that the government was going to appoint a punitive police post to keep a watch on the village. A punitive police post was a police post put in your village for which the whole village had to pay. The special police that was dispatched to the village faced a total social boycott. <clears throat> the situation came to a head on 18 June when an additional police force was also refused eatables by the shopkeepers. The police brutally beat up the villagers, including the women, who remained non-violent. More than 100 were injured. The next day, troops with machine guns were sent to the village and aeroplanes hovered overhead. The village was completely blockaded and 50 arrests were made. Neighbors wanting to show solidarity were refused permission to go. Goods were forcibly seized from shopkeepers, houses taken over for stationing the police and arrested people tortured by tying them to charpoys and making them stand in the hot June sun. Despite all this repression, a month later, the villagers were still refusing to let the policemen grind their grain at the flour mill, staying par of the peasants, which we are witnessing now at the borders of Delhi. A village in Amritsar district, Tharu, presented another interesting example of resistance. The story began when Jathas of Congress volunteers on 10th June started from Tarantaran, a nearby town, for carrying on propaganda in the villages. They reached Tharu after holding a meeting at village Mirdi in route. All of them were arrested. After this, the Congress War Council continued daily to send Jathas of volunteers, and every day they would be arrested on reaching the village. However, since the arrest seemed to have no effect in dampening the flow of volunteers or in curbing popular enthusiasm, for example, an eyewitness relates how little boys would run after the Jathas, which consisted of Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims, shouting in Kalabs in the Bad and Mahatma Gandhi ki jay. So the government now changed its policy, started arresting the volunteers before they reached the village, and then blockaded the village and unleashed terror. Witnesses maintained that shops were broken open, sick men, women, and children were beaten up brutally, all because they had looked after the Satyagrahi Jathas and refused to supply the police on credit and demanded cash, and all this despite having paid up the land revenue. Jhaman and Tharu were not exceptions. In certain districts like Hisar and Rotak, extensive arrests and prosecutions had been launched in April itself. And in others, such as Amritsar, public servants suspected of disloyalty were dismissed to serve as examples to others. <coughs> Large-scale repression was launched in early June, and 2,381 arrests had already been effected between the 1st of June and 6th of July. That is in just over a month. And sentences ranging from one to two years of rigorous imprisonment were freely given. And in early June, the Congress organizations uh, that were active in directing the struggle were declared as unlawful associations. 
However, a new change uh, came in this uh, atmosphere once the Gandhi Irwin talk started. Once the national leaders were released in January and the negotiations uh, began, loyalists were disheartened and nationalists became jubilant. And these feelings increased once the pact was signed. Military officers touring the rural areas in February had already noted reports of impending rapprochement between the government and the Congress were worrying the soldiers and other loyalist elements. Once the pact came into force, loyalists and officials became worried and nationalists became exultant. The feeling of victory was expressed in the rousing welcomes given to released prisoners. Reports of jathas of volunteers visiting villages to form Congress committees began to appear and very soon rural conferences began to be organized to which peasants were congratulated in which peasants were congratulated for their participation in the movement. In some districts of southeastern Punjab, such as Rotya, Kutar and Karnal, again very interesting, these are areas from which many of your peasants are coming from now. An attempt was made from mid-April to set up a parallel government of sorts with Congress Thanedars appointed for each Thana. And they were to hold public meetings in each large village every Sunday. Thus, the civil disobedience movement, with its emphasis on the defiance of laws and the authority of the state, had undoubtedly furthered and strengthened the process of the building up of self-confidence, dignity, and capacity to resist oppression that had been initiated and advanced among the peasants by earlier mass anti-imperialist movements. That poor villagers could refuse to give free supplies to the police and refuse to perform begar and prefer to get beaten up rather than submit, submit was unthinkable and unheard of a few years earlier. The cool determination with which the Congress volunteers offered arrest and accepted beatings, the careless abandon with which the youth of the NGBS, the Nojawan Bharat Sabha, challenged the state and even laid down their lives, the tireless consistency with which the Gadarite Kirtis, who had abandoned the charms of the West for the sake of their motherland, propagated the message of Mazdoor Kisan Raj, despite continuous interruptions by detentions, internments, and confiscation, could not but help to straighten the backs that had been kept bent for long with hard toil, servility, and fear. I now come to the next stage of the peasant movement in which it becomes much more of a pure peasant movement, more like a trade union movement, rather than just uh, as part of other broader struggles like the Pagda Sambhalo Jat. Uh, Pagdi Sambhalo Jatta movement or the Akali movement or the Gadar movement or the civil disobedience movement. And clear-cut peasant organizations uh, begin to emerge. This is the period from 1933 to 1937. I'll briefly uh, uh, talk about it because my time is running very short. Once civil disobedience movement was over and the impact of the Great Depression was being acutely felt by the agrarian classes of Punjab due to the crash in agricultural prices, which made the payment of government dues very difficult, a spate of protests arose on the issue. Demands for remission of land revenue and water rates were voiced by all political trends and meetings and petitions abounded. However, over time, it was the more left-wing elements who came to the fore and sustained the agitation. This was serious enough to worry the government, which noted that, I quote, rural agitation on communist lines, unquote, was beginning to establish itself in central Punjab by the, beginning, by the middle of 1934. It seemed that a united provincial level organization under left control might emerge in the near future. To nip this possibility in the bud, as well as in accordance with the broader policy of the government of India, uh, the Punjab government issued a notification on 10th September 1934 declaring unlawful the following five associations, which were all left-wing associations. The Anti-Imperialist League, the Punjab Provincial Naujawan Bharat Sabha, the Punjab Kirti Kisan Party, the Amritsar District Kisan Sabha, and the Punjab Kisan League. Of these two were purely peasant uh, organizations. So you can, from this, make out how dangerous these were being uh, seen. However, the movement demanding remissions in taxation continued. 
the one common demand in all districts, irrespective of the political affiliation of the groups, was for reduction in the government's appropriation of surplus via land revenue and water rates. Almost everyone wanted at least a 50% reduction immediately, as the effects of the depression had far from worn off. In Amritsar, in addition, there was an attempt to ensure that future settlements of land revenue would be lenient and assessment made on the same basis as income tax. Further, the demand for abolition of all kinds of extra cesses, which were collected in addition to the land revenue, such as Malba, which was a village common fund, Chokidara to sustain the Chokidar, Panchotra and Chahi rates were also gathering force. In addition, at gatherings organized by the left-wing groups, demands for the release of political prisoners undergoing imprisonment in the Ghadar conspiracy case of 1914-15, as well as of those detained without trial as state prisoners for a long time were lost. Please remember what a big furore was made by our government of one organization at the Tikri border holding up posters of some of the people that the government has sought to keep in prison and asking for their release on uh, Human Rights Day. You can see glimmers of it here. So asking, so political demands have always been part of the peasant movement. Political demands are not something outside the ambit of a peasant movement. Another movement directly caused by the depression that emerged in this period was around the issue of debt or karza. The form it took was of the setting up of karza committees in villages. The pattern of activity was to go into the villages and to explain to the people that they could never get free of the burden of debt unless it was cancelled. Karam Singh Man, the major communist leader of this phase, had written a pamphlet in which he had graphically described the burden by saying that if they had a line of camels and loaded each camel with one mound of rupees, the line of camels would extend to Calcutta. Such was the burden of debt. This pamphlet became very popular because it explained very graphically what the whole thing was about. After explaining the problem, peasants would be asked to join the Karza committees with a membership fee of one anna, and the new Karza committee would be formed. Obviously, the political message was also carried through these meetings, which in the words of a government report combined, I quote, agrarian agitation with communist propaganda. There is little doubt that this movement to set up the Karza committees touched a sympathetic chord in the peasant heart. The Punjab Kisan Karza Committee, a provincial level organization, was therefore set up on March 1935 in Amritsar with 52 members. Nor is it surprising that the main success of the movement was in the Jalandhar area, which was much more heavily indebted because of the small size of its holdings than, say, Amritsar. The movement clearly had an impact in making the Unionist Party later take up the issue and pass a mulerative debt legislation. I've mentioned this here because even today, indebtedness is a big issue with Kisans and writing off of debts always becomes a big issue at election time and as well as when the Kisan demands are put forward. The culmination of this process, which I just uh, talked about, was finally in on 7th March 1937, the setting up of the provincial branch of the All India Kisan Sabha. The All India Kisan Sabha had been set up in 1936 at the Lucknow session. Uh, along with the Indian National Congress, there was the first session of the All India Kisan Sabha. And the members over there were asked to set up branches of this in all their provinces. And this was a big step forward because for the first time, a provincial level organization in an organized, uh, in, in a systematic and organized way would now undertake the task of building up the Kisan movement or the peasant movement in Punjab. Kisans from, Kisan delegates from 13 districts uh, attended the meeting Delegates from the Ryasti Prajamandal attended the meeting. All the groups were there, Kirti, CSP, Gadraites, BPL Bedi, the prominent socialist leader, father of uh, uh, Kabir Bedi, uh, and uh, a Moscow-trained Gadar activist, Kartar Singh Gil. All of them were present at this. And the whole idea was that this would be a kind of joint front uh, of, of all left-inclined uh, groups and individuals. 
the this this process is not to be seen uh, taken lightly as mm -hmm. it was 12 years earlier that the first attempt to form a provincial level organization had been made and it had taken that long to actually bring this uh, to fruition and as we see the subsequent years uh, the way the peasant movement unfolded in the punjab from the years 37 to 39 we will realize how important was the formation of this headquarters of the peasant movement or the punjab kisan sabha or the punjab kisan committee before i go on to uh, that i would like to just uh, uh, spend uh, a short while Uh, talking about something which is not directly a peasant movement but it had a very powerful impact uh, on the thinking on the on the organization and on the world view of the peasants this is the election campaign of 1936-7 uh, the government of india act of 1935 which granted provincial autonomy and elections were announced to all the provincial assemblies for the first time the ministries would be formed with elected indian members the congress launched a major initiative to demonstrate that they could succeed as well at the hustings as they did on the streets and the by lanes and at the national level the main campaign turned out to be jawaharlal nehru who was also the congress president of the year and who had recently declared himself a believer in socialism in the scientific economic sense uh from the congress platform Jawaharlal Nehru turned this election campaign into a propaganda tour for socialism and thus accorded to the concept a legitimacy it had never before had in popular consciousness by lending it the weight of the prestige of the congress president and of himself personally as a consequence a whole new space political and ideological was created for the popularization of the socialist ideal and for the functioning of those who were committed to that ideal and these were of course our kisan leaders nehru made two visits to punjab in 1936 one from 29th may to 3rd june and then from 28th july to 3rd august in the course of which he covered almost the whole province the rural part of his tour was concentrated in the central districts uh, of punjab and on his first trip apart from making a brief visit to the notorious villages which i have talked about jhamman and khalra where he congratulated the villagers for their bravery the most significant attempt was his two addresses on the same day to the sarhali punjab rajnitik political conference the crowds that appeared at sarhali a village in amritsar district to see and hear the congress president broke all previous records in the province 1 lakh people were reported to have come some of them having walked 50 miles on foot Baba Vasakha Singh one of the most revered gadri heroes presided Baba Son Singh Bhakna another gadri hero unfurled the red flag the best horse in the area was secured for Jawaharlal Nehru and he was taken in procession socialist kirtis riyasti praja mandal all presented addresses to him in his second visit at the end of july uh, again the crowds reportedly reached the 1 lakh figure smaller conferences he addressed in bundala in jalandhar uh, and at khanna uh, were also held he also visited firozpur and moga where he met many gadar kirti leaders and socialist workers jawaharlal second visit came at the end of july and the government obviously tried hard to make things difficult this time on his own admission the conference at khanna that were addressed by nehru was obstructed by arrests of and restrictions on activists harkishan singh surjit recalled in an interview to me that the government refused permission to hold the conference scheduled for bundala which was surjit's own village on the village common land as was the general practice so what did surjit do he ordered the standing maize crop to be cut from 4 acres of his own land to make place for the conference and the conference was ha was ha was then held on the farm land of Harkishan Singh Surjit the rest of the year was taken up with the election campaign peasant activists were fully immersed in the campaign on the side of the congress and what is significant here is the kind of election campaign that was conducted at that time again here kishan singh sujit i will quote he was managing the election campaign of master uh, kabul singh who was a communist standing on a congress ticket 
and he describes how they spent only rupees 2000 and that too all was collected from people in amounts of 2 annas and 4 annas he also says in son singh josh's election which he was contesting against one of the biggest landlords of the province they even saved 3000 rupees from what the people gave whole campaign was conducted on bicycles <coughs> Similarly, Karan Singh Man tells us that in Joshi's election, they saved money because the people, when they came to vote, would leave one anna or one rupee along with the vote. So, do understand where the tradition of contributions for the langar, for the uh, kisan mall, for the blankets, and all is coming from. As the governor H. W. Emerson acutely observed at the time in a letter to the viceroy Lord Linlithgow. he said i doubt whether any village in the province has not been included in the election campaign by one party or another and most villages have had a constant succession of visits from canvassers there has certainly been a great stirring of the political consciousness of the masses do note this has been specially marked in sikh constituencies and i was told the other day that with many of the smaller voters there was a definite prejudice against anyone who could be described as pro government unquote this stirring of the political consciousness which the viceroy points out without which no long term movement for change can change can sustain itself was an achievement that would prove invaluable in creating new possibilities for political action in the future the election campaign had crystallized the issues in terms of pro british and anti british all these ideas had been taken into corners where they had never been heard before not even during the phases of mass anti british struggle the logic of the electoral process that all areas are included in its ambit pushed political parties to go into areas they would never dare or care to go to in normal times for a struggle you tend to mobilize only those whom you can count on whom you have worked on earlier since at that point it is dressed that their strength, strength that you need in elections you cannot win without winning over even those who you may not know at all hence the drive to extend yourself becomes inevitable therefore the impact of this election campaign of nehru's tours is something much more than one would just imagine or uh, think about if one was talking in uh, you know incremental terms in fact the momentum that was generated by this election campaign was not only maintained but increased after it was over and the year 1937 therefore may be said to mark the real beginning of the most vigorous phase of the peasant movement in pre independence punjab in fact in that year one can begin to get the feel of the intensity of the political activity that then characterized the years till the outbreak of the second world war even though there were no big morchas or big struggles in this year as they were later in 38 and 39 the movement had in fact reached a very high level with consistent village level campaigns culminating in a series of big conferences in september and october and further there was ample evidence that the unity of different political strands congress socialist communist and also some akali groups was actually working on the ground i will now uh go over to the next uh phase of the movement uh which is uh, 1938 to 39 and as my time is getting shorter and shorter i will only be able to give you uh, one or two examples and make some uh, generalizations before i go on to the uh, uh, period after 39 in the years 39 38 and 39 uh, the peasant movement in punjab reached its most mature phase of the pre independence years it blossomed forth in many directions new areas new issues new demands were introduced and the older bases were fortified further any number of specific struggles or morchas as they were popularly called developed in these years the first one that i will talk about again very briefly was the one because it was different from all the others was the movement of the tenants of the canal colonies of nilibar montgomery and multan the problems faced by tenants they were actually more properly sharecroppers 
uh, were that they had no occupancy rights, no security of tenure, no legal curbs on rent enhancement. But the tenants we are about to meet in this struggle were not even strictly speaking tenants, but sub-tenants of hold your breath, leaseholding companies who leased large chunks of colony land from the government. So mind you, private companies going into agriculture is also nothing new. And let us see what happens at that time. How this system operated and how it came into being is best described in the words of the then Punjab governor. Large areas of land, he said, on the Satlej Valley project are leased by government on temporary leases for three, four or five years, pending their allotment to permanent settlers. These temporary leases are allotted on a system of calling for tenders and in some cases are taken up by capitalists who secure very large areas. The lessees put in their own sub-tenants and naturally are anxious to make as much profit as they can. There is no doubt that in many cases they more or less rack rent the sub-tenants who usually pay in kind. Check cropping. The commonest form of rent is half the produce calculated after considerable deductions in favor of the landlord have been made from the common heap. And the subtenant has to pay all the canal dues, which, by the way, were very high. In these days of low prices, this is a very severe rent. And it is, in, it is a fact that the subtenants have a substantial grievance in this respect. There was also evidence of the agents of companies behaving just like the other big landlords and exacting bigar or free labor goods and services from the villagers. Particularly obnoxious to the tenants was the practice of having to carry the company's share to the go-downs free of charge. Reminds me of the Tabhaga movement where the peasants did not want to take the, the, to the Khalihan of the Jotedar and at times being forced to store their own produce in company go-downs. Produce was divided into two equal shares only after, as the governor described, considerable deductions in favor of the landlord had been made from the common heap. These considerable deductions, if we put them all together, actually meant that the peasant got only about 30% of the gross produce instead of the 50% that might appear at first glance. In addition, the tenant paid the entire water rate. Though the movement began in the area of the leasing companies for specific reasons, it did spread later, especially in the post-war years, to the proper landlord areas of the districts of Montgomery and Multan. The initial stimulus for protests was provided in 1937 by rivalry between leasing companies, which the Kisan leaders were able to use to the advantage of the tenants. The Punjab Kisan Committee leadership sent their best leaders and cadre to help organize the tenants, and significant victories were won. In 38, there was again trouble, and there were reports that 40,000 tenants, according to one estimate, went on strike, and a deputation came to meet the revenue minister. Obviously, that was a very large number. The government reacted. It announced fixation of maximum rents to be taken from tenants. It cancelled the tenders that had been received. And it announced that leasing companies in Nilibar could no longer claim any rent higher than 50%. A very, very big victory for the tenants because now the struggle became one for implementation and extension of this concession to other areas. I will not go into the details of this, but just to say that the this victory was won at a very high cost. While the government did give those concessions, at the same time, it took very harsh measures uh, against the activists. All the prominent activists were arrested, interned, externed. And the tenants also were given very harsh sentences at times of two and a half years of rigorous imprisonment. And it also shows us that, uh, that for a cadre to emerge from within such a rack-rented and backward group was no easy pro process. And therefore, the crucial role that was played by the activists and cadre that was sent from the central districts by the Kisan Committee was very, very important in building up the movement over here. I will now come uh, to the non-tenant uh, uh, struggles in this period, 38 and 39. I am completely running out of time, even though I started very late. So I think I probably still have a little time. Uh, the district, I now come to the district of Amritsar, in which a very, very famous 
uh, Kisan struggle was fought in 1938. Uh, this uh, the and and I'll just begin with a little background of Amritsar because again when we are talking about traditions of struggle, Amritsar is very important and the example of Amritsar is very important to actually explain the whole idea of what it means to have a tradition of struggle. The district of Amritsar occupied an enviable position in the annals of the struggle for freedom in Punjab. Jallianwala Bagh had already immortalized it in 1919. The Akali movement too fought many of its biggest, biggest battles with its, within its borders, both in Amritsar city and in the Dehat. Both city and countryside had participated fully in the civil disobedience movement of 1930-32. Kisan activists had made the area a major base with Kirti, CPI group, socialists all represented in good measure. It was also the home district of the Gadri Babas, Son Singh Bhakna and Jwala Singh, of Son Singh Josh, Dr. Kichlu, Dr. Satyapal, Udam Singh Nagoke, Munshi Ahmad Deen, Pratap Singh Kero. Thus, the Congress, the Akalis, the Communists, the Socialists all had a significant political presence here. As a consequence, it was a highly politicized area. Little wonder then that the movement that I'm about to describe was a joint effort by all the different political groups and was able to arouse an unprecedented, for a Kisan movement, degree of popular support from non-peasant sections of the population. The Morcha I'm talking about is called the Amritsar Kisan Morcha or the Amritsar Bandobast Morcha or the Uche Pulda Morcha or Bhardari Pulda Morcha as it was variously described. This was launched on 20th July 1938. On 20th July 1938, the Amritsar Bandobast Committee, Bandobast means settlement revenue settlement. This was a committee formed to, to protest against the proposed resettlement, revenue settlement of Amritsar district, which they anticipated was going to be a very high. So this was a committee formed for that. They had called uh, for a demonstration and it was meant to be an expression of a multitude of peasant grievances, including the issue of resettlement. So this demonstration that was uh, to be called in Amritsar on 20th July in the civil lines outside the office of the canal and settlement offices and outside the houses of the revenue minister and deputy commissioner. It had been supported by the district Kisan committee, the district Congress committee, and thousands of peasants began to pour into Amritsar on this date. By afternoon, a huge meeting was in progress in the Jallianwala Bagh, which all anti-imperialist forces had helped to make into a living memorial by making it the venue of an unending stream of political gatherings. However, the government imposed Section 144 in the area of the city north of the Lahore Delhi railway line in which the civil lines lay. The demonstration was thus made impossible. At the meeting, therefore, a call was given for volunteers to defy the ban and about 300 men representing the Bandobast Committee and Kisan Committee and drawn from different villages were formed into a Jatha. This Jatha led by Uddam Singh Nagoke, the nationalist Akali leader, and accompanied by other leaders such as Harnam Singh, Kasel, Sohan Singh Josh, Bibi Ragbir Kaur, a very important peasant leader, as well as a crowd of at least 5,000 to 6,000 peasants and several thousand sympathizers marched through the Hall Bazaar, which is the main market of Amritsar, and then carrying flags with the hammer and sickle, Congress flags, revolutionary placards, began to cross this bridge to try and go into the civil lines uh, area. When it reached this railway overbridge, half the Jatha was allowed to cross over before the magistrate's declaration was read out. And naturally, they said that they were going to present their grievances uh, to the, and they should be allowed to move forward. Then the city magistrate ordered a lati charge, and about 100 police constables fell upon the crowd with their lathis. The processionists immediately sat down on the ground and then lay on each other, exposing their backs to the lathis of the police. The police then proceeded to drag and push them to get them out of the way. The lati charge, which was generally described as very severe, and the use of mounted police to push back the crowd led to several older members of the Jatha falling unconscious and Udham Singh Nagoke himself badly injured in the eye and lay bleeding. In all, 300 people were seriously injured. Rest were taken away in police vans and lorries or left to be cared for by the Seva Samiti volunteers. 
minutes. The next day, the Congress MLAs created such a for in the Punjab legislature. of the Lati charge and even produced broken iron short pieces of Lati's in the assembly. The people of Amritsar responded as if the challenge had been thrown to them. The spot at which the Lati charge took place was the very same at which the crowd that was going to demand the release of Dr. Satyabal and Dr. Kichlu in April 1919 was fired upon. Look at the importance of tradition. The incident which had triggered off the chains leading to Jallianwala Bagh massacre. In fact, something of the spirit of 1919 and of the Akali Jathas, of the Akali movement, seemed to have come alive in Amritsar of those days. Same evening as the Lati charge, a huge public meeting was held in Jallianwala Bagh. Next day, two public meetings were held in the same Jallianwala Bagh. Saifuddin Kichlu again addressed another meeting. The entire bazaar went on Hartal, including Katra Aluwalya comprising the cloth markets, Guru Bazaar, Namak Mandi, grain and bullion markets, Satta chambers. <coughs> and in the evening, a huge crowd of thousands assembled to support the Jatha sent by the War Council, which then suffered a number of lucky charges. Congress members of the City Municipal Committee then walked out when they were not allowed to move an adjournment motion. Workers' organizations again offered to contribute a jatha to the satyagraha. I could go on and on. Support came from all over the country. Swami Sejan and then Jiranga. Uh, Pratap Singh Kero was a member of the committee, which then was formed uh, to deal with the whole situation. And this went on. The jathas kept on coming from all over the province. Uh, jathas of peasants came. And for 20 days, this went on. Till on the 9th and 10th of August, a visit by Chotu Ram, who was revenue minister and the prime minister of Punjab, Sikandar Hayat Khan, to Amritsar, was used by the administration to enter into negotiations with the leadership and come to some kind of an understanding where section 144 was then removed from that area. I do not have time to go into more details or even to talk about some of the very important lessons of this movement, except to point out that what is very evident in this, from the success of this movement is that it was because of the unity of all the political parties. Akalis, Congress, Socialists, Kirtis, CPI, everybody was in this together. The merchants came out in support because Congress was in the party. Others came out in support because Akalis were over there. So the success of a movement, whether it is a movement even of the peasants, heavily depends upon what kind of support you can garner from other sections of society, from broader political forces, from political parties, which is why today the government is so keen to say political parties should not be seen in this, as if there is something wrong about movements being connected to political parties or political parties coming to play a role. And somehow even the peasants... Uh, movement themselves are wary of this because they fear that this will be used against them. But in the entire history of peasant struggles, political parties have been in the thick and thin of those struggles. This is also a legitimate field of politics. This is also politics. It is not beyond politics. I... Uh, yes, I think uh, what I will have to do now is to actually just uh not go into any details uh, about the rest of what I wanted to say, but I will just uh, mention in one line each uh, what the rest of the period, the kind of things that we saw. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to mention that the other big uh, morcha, which I'm really sorry that I couldn't talk about, was what I have called the long morcha not the Long March, but the Long Murcha, the Lahore Kisan Murcha of 1938 to 39, which carried on for something like nine months from March of 1939 to December of 1939. And in this, 5,000 people went to jail. Uh, the the Jathas uh, volunteers of peasants came from all over the province. The issue was the resettlement of the district where a higher... Uh, land revenue was being uh, expected. The Morcha did not result 
uh, in, in, in success in the sense of that they won the demand. In fact, it fizzled out in the end because the government refused to negotiate uh, with them. And one of the issues that I've talked about in my work, which I <coughs> don't have the time to talk about now, but I will just mention, is that how uh, one seeing um, this, uh, uh, the, the history of uh, both the uh, uh, Amritsar Kisan Mocha and uh, the Lahore Kisan Mocha, one realizes that it is also very important for the leadership to see at one at which point in the movement a settlement which at least gets some of the major issues settled or has resulted in a major advance in the political consciousness of the peasants, the time has come to settle and not let a movement's weaknesses be exposed and uh, end up then just fizzling out. This is the contrast that I see between the Amritsar Kisan Mocha and the Lahore Kisan Mocha, where in Amritsar they were able to come to a settlement quickly uh, before the movement had spent itself out, at the peak of the movement, whereas in Lahore they were not able to do that and therefore the movement fizzled out. This does not mean that the Lahore Kisan Mocha did not have a very powerful impact. It galvanized the peasants of the whole province. People who participated in it, people who heard about it, people who talked about it, were obviously <coughs> all deeply influenced by what happened. So that is not the point I'm uh, making. The point I'm making is something different. Also, in the Lahore Kisan Mocha, it was the Punjab Kisan Committee by itself. It did not, and it had not sought, and it did not have the support of the Congress, the Akalis, and even other wings uh, of uh, the left groups and parties. It was very much a solo show by the Punjab Kisan Committee, and therefore, obviously, it had limitations of how far it could go. The other major movement, which, of course, I do not have time to talk about, but which I've dealt with at great length, was the Muzara movement in Patiala state. Year 1939 also saw the peaking of this movement. This was a very powerful movement which started in the early 30s and finally culminated in uh, agrarian legislation which gave uh, property rights to the tenants in 1953. So it was a very long drawn out movement. But from about the mid 30s, the Punjab Kisan Committee, especially the left wing, they come into it and they give the movement a lot of momentum and then guide it through all the way till 1953. And a lot of sacrifices are made in this movement, lots of very important <laughs> are made uh, in this movement. And its significance in the history of the Punjab Kisan movement cannot uh, be uh, underestimated. But I do not have the time uh, to go into it now. And therefore, what I will move on and say that further radicalization and strengthening of the movement took place from the years 1939 to 41 and then from 42 onwards in the Quit India movement. From 39 to 41, there was the anti-war movement in which, again, the left wing groups and parties were very the prominent and peasants were involved in a very big way and many sacrifices were made in this. So the issues on which peasants are mobilized are not just economic issues. We must remember this. The issues on which they get mobilized are also larger national issues here, anti-fascist, anti-war. A lot of propaganda on these lines had been done in the Punjab right from 1937. So there was a very powerful anti-war movement in this period. The individual civil disobedience movement was also very powerful. And about, uh, if I'm not wrong, about 4,000 uh, uh, people went to uh, jail in this. And in fact, the communists succeeded in making this individual uh, civil disobedience movement into a mass civil disobedience movement. But again, that's a long story. I won't have the time to go into it. 1942 itself was very interesting. Though Quit India movement did not have the same kind of response in Punjab as it had in other areas, and this for two very important reasons. Two of the political groups which were most powerful, along with the Congress among the peasantry, that is the Akalis and the communists, were both for the war. They were not against 
uh, they were supporting the British in the war and not supporting the Quit India movement. So obviously, without leadership, it could not be expected that there would be a very powerful uh, response. But this does not mean that even then that there was no response or that the mood of the people was completely with the Quit India movement. In fact, communist leader after communist leader told us that during this period, how difficult it was for them to even go to the peasants and talk about the party line of uh, people's war. He said, people said, you know, you have been telling us all these years to fight the British and now you are coming and telling us to support the British. What has happened to you? So he said, in fact, we were told by our party leadership also to lie low for this time. We couldn't make much uh, headway. And the, the sentiment was so strong in favor of Quit India, even though the number of incidents and the kind of response that was there in other provinces was not there because of the lack of leadership. The Congress, in fact, it's very interesting what Sujit said to me in his interview. He said, we, meaning the left, we were the Congress in the villages. So if those who were the Congress in the villages were not there in the Quit India movement, how could you expect the Quit India movement to have that kind of resonance in the villages? And I will uh, end with the INA prisoners uh, release movement. Uh, again, this is very, very interesting because this is again a province which is supposed to be, uh, you know, from where recruitment takes place, martial races. But the support for the soldiers of the INA who were being released and the support for the movement for the release of the Indian National Army soldiers, the kind of support it got in Punjab and Haryana was fantastic. In fact, reports say that such crowds had never been seen in the province before. When INA heroes were returning home, they were welcomed by crowds whose size and enthusiasm, I, uh, I quote, was unparalleled. You know, at the Lahore railway station itself, Shanawas, Dillo, and Segal uh, were welcomed by more than a lakh of people. And they say Lahore had never seen these kinds of uh, 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 hero, I mean, this kind of crowds uh, before. So what I'm concluding from this is that in a province which was supposed to be known for its huge presence in the British Army and therefore for its loyalty, it is indeed striking that there was such overwhelming support for those who in army parlance would be classified as traitors. This testifies to the depth of nationalist sentiment and of secular sentiment and anti-British sentiment and political consciousness uh, among the peasants of the Punjab because soldiers belong to uh, also, that soldiers belong to all religions and never did that become an issue in this uh, movement. So therefore, it would perhaps now be possible for us to conclude that this is my conclusion. By the mid-40s, large sections of the peasants of Punjab had shown that they were politically consciousness and willing to struggle for and sacrifices, sacrifice for the causes that were dear to them. Many had sacrificed their lives. Large numbers had gone to jail. Even larger numbers had voted with their feet by trudging miles to attend conferences. They had mourned the martyrs, stunned into death-like death -like silence by the hangings of Bhagat Singh, Rajguru, and Sukhdev. They had refused to pay taxes or contribute to the war effort. They had become shy of joining the army. They rejected well-loved leaders when they made the mistake of supporting the war effort and came out in lakhs to welcome the INA prisoners whom the British treated as traitors. They had voted for nationalist candidates and even left money along with their votes to show their support. They had contributed grain and cooked for thousands in the langars organized at big conferences. They had hidden runaway activists in their home and carried food for them to fields when they were hiding. In these and many other ways, ordinary men and women of the Punjab, of the rural Punjab, had shown where their hearts lay. It is for the historian to carefully collect and then tell the present generation the stories that they have left behind. It is evident then that the legacy of peasant protest that the Kisans of Punjab can draw on is a rich treasure in which are embedded not only sagas of heroism, but much wisdom based on varied experience. 
For example, the history we have traversed shows us how religion can inspire with its stories of love and sacrifice and not be allowed to divide with its history of strife and violence. How Gurdwaras provided sanctuaries and succor to those fighting for the deprived and not havens to the fanatics. How wise governments gave in to demands as in 1907, seeing the direction of the wind and how those that did not, standing on prestige and using harsh methods, ultimately had to go. That firm, patient, prolonged, nonviolent struggle based on an understanding of the issues and clear in ideology has a strength and resilience that is difficult to withstand. That when people are willing to sacrifice their all, it is for a larger purpose than to secure their immediate interests. It is for their country or the future of their children or their faith or their way of life, which they see as under threat. Remember, if their grandparents and parents could, walking on foot, braving heat and cold, lying in prison for months and years on end, braving lathis and bullets, take on the mighty British government. Can they not, with far more resources, insist at least on a hearing and on justice from their own elected government? I am talking, of course, about the peasants who are knocking at our doors. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Mukherjee, for uh, telling us the story of uh, how plowshares were beaten into swords instead of the other way, which uh, we have read. And also telling us how the experience in the past should be a very, very important point for our politicians for understanding the present. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Maharakshmi, please take over. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Amir Bhakti is uh, with us, and I will uh, request him to say a few words uh, just now. Um, unfortunately, because of some um, you know miscommunication, some issues, we were not able to get him in at eleven o'clock. But he would like to say something at this point, Professor Bhakti. He's on mute. <clears throat> Uh, he's on mute. He needs to be unmuted. Professor Bhakti, can you please unmute yourself? <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> yes, we can. I've just unmuted myself. Okay. I'm very sorry that I couldn't uh, attend the first meeting and could not welcome the incoming president, Professor Keshavan Veluthat. I did not have the good fortune of knowing him earlier, but I knew him as a uh, one of the leading students of South Indian medieval and uh, uh, pre-modern history. And I also knew that uh, he had followed the in the footsteps of Professor Irfan Habib in carrying out a big pro project on uh, uh, creating a historical atlas of South India. And it's very uh, appropriate that he should take over as the uh, uh, president of the Indian History Congress from now on for the for 2020-21. I have the good fortune of knowing Midula for a very long time, so I would not refer to him, her, as Professor Mukherjee. Uh, uh, one of the, there are several characteristics of Professor Mukherjee or Midula I had mentioned that, as you can imagine, just listening to his, her lecture, that she's passionate about what she is doing. It is not just for her a, a matter of dry historical facts. It's a matter of imbuing, Im, uh, imbuing all those facts with the, uh, let us say, passion and the ideology of somebody who wants to see the future of India in the hands of ordinary people and taking it away from the 
you know, landlords, the uh, big uh, corporate houses, uh, and and powerful uh, politicians who have only their own pelt to or power to cultivate. Uh, Midula has not only worked on peasant movements in Punjab, uh, on which she is a, a recognized authority, but she has also worked along with uh, Bipan Chandra and her husband Aditya on the independence movement of India. And there, what they have achieved is to show that in the political movement and the economic, the economic and political were always uh, uh, interconnected in all these movements. It was not a question of simply getting statehood, but it's also a question of getting the levers of power, economic power in the hands of ordinary people. What happened after that independence struggle is a matter of the history of the last 60 or 70 years. And there is not, they have also written on the uh, India since independence. And there may be controversies about what they have written, but there is no question that is all through this, there is a transparent their commitment to the, again seeing a future of India, which is much better than our, we had seen so far and what uh, our ancestors had also seen. And I ho hope that the vision that uh, Midula, Aditya and others have, of, uh, and Professor Habib have of India will ultimately be realized despite the machinations of all kinds of external and internal forces trying to suppress the, the, the desires of the ordinary people, the desires which are entirely based on their own work, on their own volition and all that. With these few words, I will end. And thanking both Russell Belthart and Mirdula for their wonderful work that is, will serve historians and uh, students of Indian uh, politics and, and economics for a long time. I'll end my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Bhakti. It is my pleasant duty to thank Professor Ridula Mukherjee for delivering an excellent lecture on the Punjab Kisan movement in colonial Punjab. The significance of such a historical analysis cannot be lost to this audience. At a time when the Punjab Kisans have been standing at the borders of Delhi for over a month, raising issues of livelihood, corporatization, and revocation of the three farm laws that were passed by the parliament in September 2020. Such a reflection by a historian who has extensively researched on the theme of nonviolent violent farm protests less than a century earlier is of utmost importance. I also thank Professor Keshavan Veluthat for graciously chairing this session. As he very rightly pointed out, this session is normally held on the evening of the first day when the annual session is held. Um, and unfortunately, this year, we could not have the annual session on this date. Uh, this evening would have been the uh, time when we would have otherwise scheduled this particular uh, lecture. Uh, it was really uh, to, to mark that uh, lecture uh, as it would have occurred if the 81st session had been held when Professor Veluthat would have taken over as the president that uh, we made the request to him and he was so kind as to agree to uh, chair this session. I take this opportunity to place on record my deep gratitude to Professor Amyo Bagchi for his unstinting support and sage advice throughout this past year. I'm really very grateful to you, sir. Last but not the least, I thank the IHC team that has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure that this uh, program could be held without a hitch. Ansh, Deepak, Deepna, Sneha, Prerna, Aishwarya, Trisha, Novanil, Abhimanyu, and Jitender. 
Incidentally, all of them are sitting in their homes in different parts of the country, and they have been coordinating with each other um, from their homes. So from Jammu to Kerala, uh, from Assam to Maharashtra, we have had people who have been uh, working uh, for the IHC, and that is typical of the IHC itself, its national character. I'm grateful to all our members and also the non-members who have registered for our events and participated in this morning's program. I was just told that over 500 people have attended this program. I request all of you to join us for our afternoon program at 2.30 p.m. when we will have the inaugural session of the webinar on Indian Civilization Historical Perspectives. With these words, I thank you once again for being here. And I look forward to uh, meeting all of you at the 81st session when we finally do manage to hold it in the new year. Thank you.
Lakshmi Dhitan Patel. Uh, hello, hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good afternoon to everyone who has joined this. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, sir. Yes. Uh, At your we can begin. Um, yes. Professor Amir Kumar Bachchi, General President of the Indian History Congress. <laughs> Professor Irfan Habib, Professor Emeritus, AMU, and Vice President of the Indian History Congress, who will deliver the inaugural address of the webinar. Members of the EC and general body of the IHC, presidents of the different sections of the 81st session who are with us today, delegates, students, friends. The study of Indian history received an institutional platform at the national level with the founding of the Indian History Congress in 1935, then known as the All India Modern History Congress. The president Pina, of the first session, members of, of the Shafat EC Ahmad Khan, and general body drew our attention to the deficiencies in the current state of historical research of his time that impeded a better and more holistic understanding of our past. One of the major concerns that he flagged was the communal, partisan, and prejudiced view of the Indian past that was rooted in contemporary political assertions, whether colonial communal, regional, or nationalist in orientation. Similarly, nationalist bias, racial prejudice, regionalism, and narrow chauvinistic concerns were critiqued by R.C. Majumdar, president of the Indian History Congress in 1939. Mohammed Habib, president of the first IHC held under the flag of a free and independent India, severely critiqued the colonial administration of the British for the communal prejudices it had institutionalized politically and administratively. 
Khan, Majumdar, and Habib were among the many who were a part of this august body, the IHC, who espoused a sign where the prejudices and biases that are stalwarts denounced in no uncertain terms have again begun to rear their head in a conspicuous manner. And keeping with the tradition of those stalwarts of the Indian History Congress, we need not shy away from rejecting the misrepresentations of our past. The theme for this webinar is Part Indian of Civilization, body, Historical IHC, Perspectives. And it serves as an important entry point to unravel the different layers and traditions that have gone into the making of India. Historians, anthropologists, archaeologists, and sociologists have often referred to the overarching unity of the Indian subcontinent and paradoxically mm -hmm. in many works, an understanding of a civilizational ethos underscored the unity despite the perceived diversity. This discussion was often quite nuanced, as seen in R.C. Majumdar's understanding of Indian civilization that he elaborated upon in his presidential address in 1939. Not merely did Majumdar emphasize the pan-Indian unifying elements, he drew our attention to connections beyond the subcontinent, in the ancient and medieval periods of Indian history that contributed to the flowering of Indian civilization. In other words, while a specific geocultural frame was highlighted, the civilizational canvas itself was understood to be much larger. More recently, Shireen Musri and Bidi Chattopadhyay, in their respective presidential addresses, have touched upon issues that have a bearing on the theme of our webinar. Musri takes a panoramic view of the idea of India as it evolved, and context and process are richly interwoven in her analysis. Chattopadhyay interrogates the conceptual basis of the idea of India as understood through the unity in diversity thesis. He argues that invariably diversity gets subsumed under the canopy of unity and that heterogeneity and the idea of many Indias may prove more fruitful in our search for our past. The term civilization thus invokes several related concepts and themes. And it is our intention to play on that interrelatedness so as to meaningfully engage with the historical dimensions of Indian civilization. A recent work suggests that the notion of Indian civilization is nothing but a myth. This is Sanjay Subramanian full. And that in we should our it for our uh, its study altogether. The term civilization thus this is an several related concepts. There is and no themes. doubt that the theme it itself is affords immense possibility for reflection on our past and present from different vantage points. It is with such a view that we have invited some of our most eminent historians and archaeologists to present their ideas and enrich our understanding. On behalf of my co conveners of this webinar, Professor Syed Ali Nadim Razavi and Dr. Burton Cletus, I thank you all for your overwhelming response to this event and welcome you to the webinar on Indian Civilization Historical Perspectives that is being held on Google Meet and is streaming live on the Indian History Congress's YouTube and Facebook pages. I now invite you to take a brief look at the program. We begin this inaugural session with Professor Amir Bhakti taking the chair, the general president for the 80th session. And the inaugural address will be delivered by Professor Irfan Habib. The other two papers that we have scheduled in this first session of the webinar are those by Professor Shireen Muswi and Professor Aditya Mukherjee. Professor Shireen Muswi will be speaking on ideas and society, Suli Kul and Akbar's social ethics. We also have Professor Aditya Mukherjee who will be talking to us about the civilizational values of the national liberation struggle in India. Tomorrow, that is the 29th December, the session starts at 10 a.m. 
and we commence with the chair being taken by Professor Indu Banga, uh, who will then oversee the proceedings where we have three speakers. Professor Rajan Gurukul will be speaking on revisiting archaeological perception of culture in Indian civilization. Professor K. M. Srimali will be speaking on revisiting Ambedkar's riddles in Hinduism. And Professor Syed Ali Nadim Rezavi will be speaking on medieval monuments as symbols of a composite civilization. In the third session, which is the concluding session of this webinar on 29, that is tomorrow, which will start at 2 p.m., the chair will be the first is by V. Selva Kumar on hunter-gatherers in historical South India. The second presentation will be by Kumkum Roy on dharma, dialogue, and dissent. Is an inclusive civilization possible? The third talk is by Professor Sucheta Mahajan on religion, society, and secular practice, a walk with Gandhi. And the last paper of this session will be by Professor Deepak Kumar on probing reason and synthesis in our civilizational discourse. As I'm sure you will agree with me, we have a very rich array of papers that are going to be uh, presented. And I'm sure a number of important and interesting themes and ideas that will be deliberated upon by our speakers. We look forward to a very, very engaging webinar. And although this is a format that we are only learning um, more and more about as um, we are confined to our homes um, and have to engage in our academic work um, through the laptops and virtual screens, I'm sure that despite that limitation, we will all gain much from the deliberations over the next two days. So I thank you all for being here. Uh, what we will do is at the end of every session, we will take questions which you can type out in the chat boxes. And uh, we will read them out at the end of the session. And I will present them to the uh, with the permission of the chair. And the speakers can then address those questions. I now hand over to Professor Amiya Kumar Bakchi, uh, eminent economist, uh, uh, who is renowned as uh, an economic historian, the author of several acclaimed works, the recipient of the Padma Shri Award, who will be chairing this session. Professor Bakchi. Professor Bakshi is on mute. He needs to unmute himself. Sir, Professor Bakshi, can you please unmute yourself? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Professor Habib appeared as a nova in the Indian historical horizon with his agrarian system of Mughal India. And our understanding of pre-British India has been totally transformed by his work in several other directions. His magisterial historical atlas of India uh, worked out with his geographer's son, with his long series of people's history of India spanning the whole period from uh, I don't know whether he has covered the Mundyadara civilization, but also but certainly from the Vedic period until the British period. His work on Tipu Sultan, his work on the technology of Mughal India, all of these have become part of our historic imagination. But Professor Habib has also been an activist in the 
great tradition of the Indian History Congress. He has always uh, stood out for the secular values of India, for the diversity of India, the kinds of values that I associate with the work of Rabindranath Tagore and Mahatma Gandhi. And we hope that Professor Habib enrich our understanding of Indian history for uh, uh, as long as we can have him with us. And in the case of Aditya Mukherjee, I've known him as a young historian from, and economist from, for a very long time. The kind of work that he has done, uh, partly with Professor Pipan Chando, partly with his wife, Medula Mahajan, now Medula Mukherjee, has been primarily concentrating on the history of India's liberation struggle, its economic foundations, its ideology in different places, the kind of nationalism that Indian leaders had, the sort of ways in which that nationalism has been distorted to fit the agenda of the Hindu Tawalas. And it has been, he also has been like Professor Habib, an outstandingly public intellectual. And I look forward to the, both the inaugural address of Professor Habib and to the paper that Aditya will present later on. Sir, may I add that Professor Shirin Musvi will also be presenting in this session. Okay. Well, again, I have known Shirin for quite some time, primarily as a historian of Mughal India. She particularly made contributions to the economic and uh, currency aspects of the uh, of Mughal India, and I have continued to benefit and follow from her work. So I would also very much work, uh, welcome Shirin to this session. I know that she has also been moving like Professor Habib behind the way the Indian History Congress has continued to grow despite all the obstacles that it has faced, particularly from the current government. Uh, yes, am I to speak now? Yes, yes. sir. Um, <clears throat> Professor Amya Bhakti, Professor Alakshmi, friends and colleagues in the Indian History Congress and others, other friends who may be listening in. It's, I'm really very grateful for the kind remarks of our General President, Professor Bakchi. And um, I hope that to some extent, not fully of course, I may have some success in meeting his expectations. I have been given the task of speaking on Indian civilization in an inaugural address, which I suppose means that I should cover the entire range of Indian civilization, which is very difficult to do, but at least some aspects could be commented upon. Well, I shall immediately proceed to the task. Um, the word civilization among historians applies to a particular stage uh, of human progress, particularly when class societies have developed, cities have come, and some kind of ideology has developed. Previously, it used to be related to the rise of cities, and only when cities came, civilization was supposed to be in existence. But now, I think the definition is broader, and some kind of ideology, some kind of social organization, are all recognized 
as hallmarks of a civilized community or society. On that test, of course, archaeology has discovered that India has its beginnings of its civilization has its beginning somewhere around the third millennium BC, beginning sometime after 3000 BC, around 2600 BC, when Indus civilization came into existence. We know, and textbooks tell us, that the Indus civilization was the first culture in India which had cities, which had masonry houses, drains, roads and so forth. But I think one particular importance that attaches to the Indus civilization from the point of ideology and communication is that it had a written script. And I think that's a very important feature of it, which often gets missed in the discussion whether the script was Aryan or Dravidian or neither Aryan nor Dravidian. I would like to take the script itself. All the signs had been reduced, as we now know, to about 450 characters, which were either ideographs or pictographs. Unfortunately, we cannot decipher them, but we can know. We know that messages and inscriptions of the length of even three lines or more used to be uh, put on seals and sometimes on stone. And this, of course, meant that they had this extremely new uh, means of communication, which actually at that time few civilizations like the Egyptian and the Mesopotamian had. I understand that Chinese script came a little later, but I may be mistaken on that because I'm relying on old sources. Nevertheless, it was a unique in innovation. And when we study it, we find that some pictographic sign, particularly the fish sign, uh, leads us to Dravidian connections. Escoparpola particularly underlined the fish sign in the Dravidian word mean, which also applies to stars. And I think he made a very convincing case of this connection. The late Iravatham Mahadevan then marked on the arrow sign and related it to the Dravidian, proto Dravidian Champu, a terminal um, a terminal letter. And therefore, it is probable that the Indus culture had Dravidian connections or proto Dravidian connections. How deep were they? How extensive were they? We cannot actually work out. But I think it is important that we should study these matters irrespective of ideology, particularly today when the government is making a fetish, fetish of calling Indus civilization the Saraswati or Saraswati Sindhu civilization. We should be clear about it. The second point I would like to hmm, underline is that it is not only the cities that disappeared, but the script disappeared. Such an important invention left no trace behind. And that is also very important when we discuss the end of the Indus civilization and the question of continuities between the Indus civilization and our classic ancient Indian civilization. I think it is now well understood that the destruction or the end of the civilization was practically complete with neither cities nor the script which is very important being uh, having survived the destruction of the civilization. 
because archaeology makes it clear that after 1800 BC until about 500 BC there are no cities in India. There is no nothing succeeding Mohanjadar or Harap. There is no sign, a letter, no sign of any script. A great breach between the Indus civilization or our continuous ancient civilization is almost unbridgeable. How it took place, I am not uh, going to discuss now because it's clear that the Indo-European infusion came immediately or very soon after the Indus civilization, if not only linguistic and archaeological, but also um, evidence of genetic genetics is now to be considered. We therefore begin next with the Rig Veda. I've as a layman, what seems remarkable to me and what all of us can take pride in is the fact that around with so much ritual and even magic, Rig Veda has passages of enormous wisdom, how they could arise in a primitive community with no cities, with no writing, is indeed a wonder. As you might have guessed, I was referring to the creation hymn, where the question is asked with few in any primitive communities would have asked. How did this creation come about? Was it by itself or but by some creator? Of course, scientists are still looking for it in the universe and we are not yet finding the answers. But it goes further and says that even God, even one become the God who controls everything was post-creation. A remarkable notion, a creation without creator. And even he, the possibility is that even he wouldn't know how creation came about. In a single passage, there is both monotheism, monotheism and atheism. In a single passage, there is an enormous question asked for which no one could discover the answer. <coughs> However, the Vedic society came about by destruction or evolution, one could always take pride in such a passage. I then pass on to the Upanishads because I feel that when one talks of civilization, one talks eminently of ideas. And what makes me wonder is how the caste system is developing through these ages and how much effect does it have on ideology. We are past that time when we thought that the caste system with its endogamy and subcaste came at one at once. We are now looking both at its development and its diffusion. It couldn't have come all over India at the same time. All the institutions of it could not have developed at the same time. It developed gradually. And in fact, if one looks at the reference to the four Varnas, the word Varna is not used there, in the 10th Mandala of the Rig Veda, that passage could have been found in the in any religious book that society is divided into classes. It doesn't necessarily mean a caste system. Brahmans, Rajanyas or Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras, 
could be found in any society in Iran, let us say. So, actually, the development of professional specification and the development of endogamy are processes that took place over a long time. And I think we should, in our ancient, study of ancient Indian civilization, should need, need to bear this in mind all the time. Clearly then, if one comes to texts like Upanishads, it's a, or the post Vedic literature, Brahmanas and so on, one should not assume that the caste system in its present form and in its classic form then existed. One should not produce, proceed from that nation. Differences, with class differences had begun to exist. They had begun to influence ideology, but only gradually. And certainly, the whole theory of transmigration of souls is related to this long and slow process. I would like to refer here to two sets of evidence which is attracted me particularly. One is the figure of Yad Navalki, who tells his wife, Maitreya, that one should love everything and everyone. And who tells Artabhava that when you talk about Atman, always think of karman, deeds, they are the most important. Ethics is the main of main importance. And then I have in mind the story of Satya Kama and Chandogya Upanishad, who is accepted by his teacher as a Brahman because he is truthful about his illegitimate birth. Truth and not birth is here the test. Well, I wonder that when the caste system produces its ideological justification, when was it produced? It appears in, it appears for example in Chandogya Upanishad, but are they really, is it really post pre Buddhist? Uh, it is their transmigration of souls, the main justification for the caste system, ideological justification for the caste system is there attributed to the Kshatriyas. And one remembers immediately that Gautama Buddha and Mahavira, who both emphasized or stressed the theory of transmigration of souls were Kshatriyas, they were not Brahmins. And in the early Pan Pali Kanam, Kshatriyas are given preference over Brahmans in status. And endogamy is emphasized. Therefore, it looks to me that not only that Upanishads might be dated a little later than they are dated today, but also that the great justification of the caste system was inherent not so much in Brahmanism as in Buddhism and Jainism. And therefore, <coughs> the development of the ideological support for the development of caste system came from all the three religions. Uh, I feel then that probably the caste system was developed in what is now Bihar in Eastern UP, the homeland of Buddhism and Jainism, and then spread over the centuries, next four or five centuries over the whole of India. <coughs> and that process perhaps needs to be more carefully looked at from inscriptions and other texts than has been the case. Too often we date 
text, Sanskrit text, very early, uh, perhaps earlier than is um, plausible. But I'm not a Sanskritist. I can only <coughs> suggest that these things should be looked at more closely than has been the case until now. Um, here I want to shift to a totally different plane, and that is Ashoka. I think that when you consider Ashoka, you consider almost a miracle. You have here that they are writing first of all. And by writing, I don't mean the kind of letters of Brahmi or Tamil Brahmi, which have been found in Tamil Nadu <coughs> and in Sri Lanka, which suggests that Brahmi came to the Mauryan Empire through South India and Sri Lanka rather than the other way around. But there are no texts in that script. It is Ashoka, it is in Ashokan inscriptions that the script is systematized, that the silent vowel, short vowel, uh, uh, is embedded in the letter. And for this reason, Ashokan inscriptions must be regarded still as the initial point of writing in India, both in Brahmi and, of course, in Karoshti scripts. Ashoka is also Therefore, the first draftsman. <coughs> I can't regard, I can't actually, when I look at his inscriptions, although the seven pillar edict is only found in one pillar, it's a remarkable piece if you look at the logic and systematized way in which every, every point is made. I therefore don't agree with the distinguished historian that Ashoka was by his 10, 20, 27th year, losing his uh, wits or wisdom. I think he was very clear in it. But it's not only the script that gave to India such a great vehicle of civilizing agency. It is also in practically everything, in ideas, that Ashoka should make social ethics the main policy of his empire is, I think, unique in the world. He is not seeking the advancement of any religion. He is seeking the enforcement of social ethics. <coughs> and I think he is the first ruler in the world who thinks of the poor, the wretched. Um, I think also that he invokes religion only in so far as it might help to enforce social ethics. And therefore, in his Prakrit edicts, he offers to his subjects the inviting notion of Swarg or heaven. But when he goes to Aramaic, he forgets it. He there when he says is, he then becomes a Zoroastrian. And he says that then you will be you will have an easy time on the day of judgment. It greatly amused me because the whole idea of Day of Judgment is Zoroastrian. It comes, came to Jews from Zoroastrianism, then it came to Christians, and then it came to Muslims. And Ashoka is here telling his Iranian-speaking or Aramic mm, reading subjects that if you follow my social ethics, you will not have any trouble with God 
Of course, the word God is not there, but judgment is of course given by God in Zoroastrian. Uh, if you follow the social ethics. But when he comes to the Greek version of the same edict, he knows that Greeks don't believe in any nonsense like afterlife and therefore he's silent about the reward in afterlife. Shoka, I think, is was far more wise than we have thought of him. You knew what could attract his audience. And it was dharma or moral conduct that he was more concerned with than, of course, religious advancement, although I'm sure he was a uh, dedicated Buddhist and supported the Sangha. But I think if all the BJP ministers read his Crocodic 12, India may be a still better country. Or Adirokadic 12, as might, I might waste time in mentioning, because everybody would know about it, was a tolerance edict. How there should be religious tolerance and acceptance of each other. <coughs> Not only that, but Ashoka was, of course, the main architect of Indian art. Indian art seems to be begins with Ashoka, whether it, you take sculpture or whether you take architecture, cave architecture. Uh, since of course I have limited time, I would not like to go in greater details in it, but um, it seems to me that there are many things to be proud of in India. But Ashoka is a particular figure in which we should particularly take pride. Um, Ashokan art is important because from it proceeds almost every other school of art. Gandhar art with the Greek influence and Mathara art combining both Greek and post Mauryan art. And then, of course, Ajanta and Alara, the rock cut art, all ultimately proceed from Morgan art. Buddhism, of course, had its human side. And in things like <coughs> Bharat, Mathura, if you take Jain art also, and Ajanta and part of Elora, it has given us a great social message also. Whenever I think of Ajanta, I think of the painting Punishment of the Dancing Girl. And I can't think of portrayal of a greater cruelty. and the sympathy of the artist with the dancing girl. Uh, well, there was the development of Sanskrit literature in which we can all take pride. We can always say how great a Chang of Shakuntala and Bana as both a historian and critic. But I think I'll end with my ancient Indian part with uh, what Amir Khusran, a Persian poet of the 13th, early 13th century in 1318 said of ancient India, that India had made, had three gifts for the world. One was the place value system, the numerals, Insa. As we know, 
place value system was already spoken about by Indian astronomers and mathematicians. But actually the first inscription bearing it <coughs> is, 15, is 595 AD. But by early 18th century, it is reported on in China. I don't know why Needham, who was such a great scholar of Chinese, was disputing the early date of the numerical system in India because it is a Chinese text which dates it earlier than 770. And then, of course, the Arabs, almost immediately afterwards, not only took the system up, but named it after India, Hinsa. So it is to our mathematicians and scientists that we so, so, owe such a great invention. And it is to the credit of Amir Khusra that he should remind it of us, remind us of it. The second thing that struck Amir Khusra was, he said that we gave chess to the world. Newspapers often forget it. Chatranj is our gift to the world through Iran. <coughs> and the third thing he meant, he said, was we gave the world Panchatantra, the animal studies. And it is of course true that Panchatantra in third century, by, written by third century, had gone to Iran, being translated there into Iranian then into Syriac, then into Arabic, then into all the European languages and on Persian on the one side. And of course they changed their character, but it was Akbar who brought the original Panchatantra also in Persian translation, in fact very not known, very widely known. But the original Panchatantra or the Sanskrit edition of Panchatantra, it had few versions, was again translated into Persian by Akbar, who discovered that this version was had become quite different from the <coughs> Syriac version. So these are the great the three achievements which occurred to a poet, an Indian poet in the 14th century, as our gifts to the world. But we have mostly forgotten it. Passing on to medieval India, and here I take medieval India in the larger sense of the 7th century, great century onwards. I would like to first refer to the to the Islamic uh, ideologies. It's an often a mistake to think that Muslims are just one school of thought. And <coughs> then speak about their influence on Indian thought. Islamic theology as has often been recognized, has one single problem. Very much like Jewish theology, it has strict principles and an expectation of reward after death, after the day of judgment. This raises a very moral question very early in within Islam, not in India, but first outside in Iraq. From a woman called Rabia Basri, who raised the question whether it is a marketplace that you serve someone and then expect a reward? Is that your religion? or that you do on the basis of belief without expectation of reward, out of love for God. And it is this rejection, this distaste of 
getting a reward in heaven which begins a new moralizing tendency a new moral tendency deed of welfare for its own sake it has it had there for vast consequences i give you only two examples from fairly theological figures they were sufis but they believed in theology nizamuddin the sufi saint in his conversations praised the conduct of those who released slaves even if this meant that they would leave islam and become hindus again the other part was an important for him what was important was the release there are two episodes about it i don't have the time to discuss it <coughs> but he this uh, preference of moral conduct over theological requirement is certainly important he also thought that many yogic practices and beliefs are important for muslims as but that that has nothing to do with morals his people his disciple nasiruddin sheikh nasiruddin jara in his conversations praised rabia basri and although it will take unnecessary time i am particularly enamored of this story a number of muslim theologians went to rabia basri saying that you are talking very responsibly so because we want to discipline you you should choose one of us as your husband to keep you under control rabia basri then asked the leading theologian among them if i could i ask the question which she said yes she said when god created the universe how did he divide wisdom between men and women the theologian knew the answer he said 9 tenth of wisdom went to men and 1 tenth of wisdom went to women and then she asked and when lust was divided what happened then the answer was 9 tenth of lust went to women and 1 tenth of lust went to men and rabia basri then exclaimed oh god look at these men i am controlling only with my 1 tenth of wisdom 9 tenth of lust and they, these people with 9 tenth of wisdom can't control 1 tenth of lust go away she said now nasiruddin tirath tells this story without any provocation nobody asked him he just told it so clearly the islamic theory theological theory that men are superior to women was not a convincing position for nasiruddin otherwise why should he have told this story and they had mistakes had a large amount of respect for rabia bas well Islam introduced something in India which had not been introduced in it and that was the peculiar concept of a religion which is purely uh, Parsi and Jewish everyone belongs to he must belong to a particular religion to stand up and be counted 
this kind of perception of concept of religion did not exist in india or in china or countries outside or even in the mediterranean before the spread of christianity that you have to define your religion and that is why no word corresponding to hinduism exists in sanskrit ashoka when he talks of religion he talks of brahmans and shramans that is about all there is no particular word for religion in hindi because dharma means kanda or principles and therefore this was a totally new concept which which non muslims i will start say first non muslims adjusted and when they adjusted they naturally took the name which outsiders had given to them hindu which is of course originally from hind or india and therefore what medieval times created was a new religious perception whether you put it in the concept of 16 darshanas which i believe did not exist in ancient india there are these 16 schools or sometimes only 6 or 7 schools that they exist to the exclusion of course of muslim and christian in view but of varying beliefs um <clears throat> and the second important development within hinduism now that we can call it hinduism was that islamic monotheism greatly gave a fillip to the spread of shankaracharya's ideas of pantheism it is very interesting to trace the development of pantheistic ideas in hinduism um when you relate simultaneously to the spread of pantheism in uh, islam by yogbar's time wahdatul wujud of ibn al-arabi was practically the dominant ideology among non-theologians but akbar's pundits did not recognize shankaracharya and his version of vedanta so it is not mentioned in abul fazl's comprehensive description of hinduism but under jahangir chit roop or jad roop as jahangir raishur name conveyed to him shankaracharya's ideas and therefore jahangir gave a famous equation of vedant that is shankaracharya's vedant with tasavvuf that is ibn al-arabi's tasavvuf this is a famous definition so here the two philosophies meet since my colleague professor musvi will be speaking about akbar i will not touch on that figure as i i would have praised him in the same manner that i had praised ashoka and i am here with the nationalist historians on whose lips the name of these rulers were always there when they uh, contested the british claim to be the best rulers i have i should before coming to modern times and because i think i am taking more time than i should um uh, i would um, particularly mark on one important achievement of 17th century india that was 
Dabistan, a book on religions, composed by a Parsi. Kakhusra um, Asfandiyar, whose book is now available in three versions. He gives a long description of Zoroastrianism. He gives a long description of Hinduism and all its sects, then of Judaism, Christianity, and many sects of Islam. I'd say, I think it's a unique piece of writing on religion anywhere in the world at that time. I would like now to close with something about modern times. Today, one wishes to have the presence of Ram Mohan Roy, a man so full of medieval culture as is divulged to us in his half Arabic, half Persian, Tafatul Mujahideen, Gifts of Manuthis, 1503. And then, of course, his turn to modern times, his total addiction to reason and rationalism. His statement that caste, caste loyalties destroy nationalism, destroy nationhood. His insistence that what was given to the landlords in the shape of fixed rents should also be given to peasants in fixed rents. Peasants should also have the rents fixed so that they are not increased at will by the landlord. To, such, to say such a thing while being a landlord himself and to say, to give so, such reasons for it in 1831 was really remarkable. And one salutes too his successors, the social reformers, Ishwar Chand Vidya Sagar, for the statement <coughs> that Shastras, in his view, uh, permitted women to be educated. But if all the Shastras were to say that women should not be educated, they would be wrong. They can't be followed. That was courage. Or the Bengal social reformers of Brahma Samaj in Tagore, who spoke of reason, who spoke of welfare, who spoke of women's rights. Particularly, I would like to recall Keshav Chandra Sen in this direction. I would also try, I'll also recall the fact that when European thought was accepted, it was also distilled. And a man like Sayyid Ahmad Khan would give first place to reason, almost to the same extent as Ram, Roham, Ram Mohan Roy had done. The word of God must be subordinate to the work of God. That is to say, what one finds in nature, what one finds in science, cannot be rejected by religion. It must be subordinate. He and Abul Kalam Azad later on, both, both well versed in theology, wondered whether religion has really done anything for humanity or has killed more than it has saved. These are bold thoughts which one recalls. And I finally come to our great figures, Gandhi and Nehru, who are also, to my mind, two great representatives of our civilization. <coughs> Gandhi 
Gandhi ji changed his views substantively over the statement that he preferred truth to consistency is remarkably bold and i think therefore that what he did for the country and also his final ideology i remember reading as a school boy an interview in which the foreign correspondent asked why he when he was saying that men and women are equal would he make women soldiers and gandhi replied why not and i would rather make them generals because unlike men they would have compassion they would have wisdom and as far as the wall on nehru is concerned i think his autobiography his letters to indira gandhi and discovery of india this despite the fact that i may differ i am a small man but may differ here and there from his particular judgments but these are works which represent a rational ideology for india and therefore as enormous contributions to reason and logic in india we are having our own task with destiny today and to read gandhi and nehru again we encourage us to face it thank you thank you sir professor bagchi sir professor bagchi you have to unmute yourself <laughs> professor habib has given us a magisterial overview of indian civilization from the time of indus valley civilization down to the present he has convincingly argued that indus valley civilization had probably very strong links with the Dravidian civilization down south. He has also put Ashoka as a central figure in our understanding of the Indian civilization. A man who had compassion for the poor, who a man who had imagination for the whole of India, where he planted his pillars in various places. A man who thought beyond India. sending his son and daughter to sri lanka and he has also shown that in the islamic concepts there is not a simple kind of you know uh, monotheistic belief there is also questioning in that questioning that the woman rabia raised again and again a questioning that uh, the great sufi saint nizamuddin put as uh, moral authority over any kind of religious belief and he has come down to our great figures mahatma gandhi and jawahar lal nehru who again had uh, had a view of both ancient india and modern india as a diverse civilization in which all kinds of uh, beliefs could coexist together without conflict and uh, where there would be uh, let us say differences of opinion but they would all be resolved in a peaceful way and not with violence and this is the kind of view that would if we, if it informed our modern 
people uh, the rulers that would have been much better off than we are at the moment. Sir? Any questions? Sir, can we... Uh, I have a question to Professor Habib. Yes. Please, Rovinda Tagore, in your overview. Oh, I'm too small a man to assess such a great figure. I did mention Rabindranath Tagore, but I was running out of time. Um, as a historian, Rabindranath Tagore great, deserves great respect because very early in his career, he wrote an essay in which he said that Indian history is an integrated one in which all should have a share, particularly he had in mind, of course, the Hindu and Muslim strains. So he didn't, he, and in Bharti also, he took care that uh, Muslim culture, the Muslim thought should also be studied. I know this because he invited my father to deliver lectures on Sufism, Muslim mysticism. And uh, this was his invitation that finally led my father to uh, do his research in Muslim mysticism. He gave his lectures there. So Rabindranath Tagore is really one of the builders of modern India. Nobody, there's, uh, there can't be any two views about him. And almost on any issue that comes today, one can refer and go back to Tagore and get a word of wisdom out of the large store of writings that he has left behind. Any other questions? Sir, there is a question in the chat box from Shubham from Central University of South Bihar, who asks, according to you, tracing from 2600 BC to contemporary Indian civilization, what are the two biggest peculiar cornerstones of our civilization? Well, I think they can't be reduced to two cornerstones. There are too many corners <laughs> in, in Indian civilization. One can only pick up certain uh, important indicators, and of course, any selection would be partial and not full. That is all, sir. There are no more questions. So, may I now invite Professor Aditya Mukherjee to give his talk? Is Professor Mukherjee here? Um, I think uh, we thought that the order will be Professor Shireen Musfi next. So maybe okay. he has muted himself temporarily because of that. All right. So may I ask Professor Musfi to give her talk now? Professor Musvi, there, Professor Musvi has just turned on her video, but we can't seem to hear her. Professor Amivati, Professor Mahalakshmi, Professor Irfan Habib, Professor Aditya Mukherjee, and all other fellow members of the Indian History Fund. Uh, my team has already been announced by Professor um, Mahalakshmi, and it is Ideas and Society, Surya Pul and Adverse Social Effects. Ideas often have movement of their own, which then react upon society or at any rate social output. 
nor are the ideas in sulla they transfer from one civilization to another across all boundaries both of these factors are present in the history of the idea of surya kuri total peace that became the official doctrine under akbar from about 1580 onwards the origin of the notion of surya kuri goes back to the reaction against the concept of ultimate reward and punishment the idea of heaven and hell in muslim theology rabia basri nera in the late 8th century countered with the idea of love of god for its own sake rejecting any notion of reward and punishment this led to the sufi concept of fana or self annihilation which could also be seen as union with god ultimately this led to the pantheistic formulation of the religious wujud unity of existence by ibn arabi in the first half of the 13th century these ideas then traveled from arabic to persian and finally to india already by the 15th century as it is well summed up in a passage by abul fazl in the ayn al-bari that has unfortunately been mistranslated by block its practical implication surah kul that is total peace or peace with all made great appeal to akbar in late 1570s the evidence of uh, first of all let us consider what india especially the northern india was like when akbar on his father's sudden death occupied the throne in 1556 at the younger age of 40 it should be appreciated that a consensus of the majors of religious coexistence in the political and social sphere had long been accepted since the early days of the delhi sultanate the dev- evidence of presence of hindu officials in the administration in the sultanate administration is available right from alauddin khalji's reign that is 1296 to 1313 where we have uh, we found khatar kheru as his main master and is fairly well established in the administration of muhammad tola in the immediately preceding sur administration the spectacular status bestowed upon him by adil shah adil shah sur is not to be treated just as an aberration todermal also a bureaucrat without any chiefly status must have held a high position in the sur administration otherwise it would not have been possible for him to rise to so high a position in akbar's administration in early 1562 and 63 besides the individual examples of high ranking hindu officials is well attested that that the shir shah's orders and official endorsement on them were often binding the persian text being also written in the nagri script there is no prior example of such a consideration for the convenience of hindu officials it is certainly a strong testimony to wide presence of hindus at least at the level of revenue collectors and petty officials the prevailing condition in north india have been most aptly summed up by abdul qadir qadayuni who describing sharif amuli's arrival in hindustan from the dakin laments that since hindustan is a vast country the scope here for free conduct is broad one does not concern oneself with others and every can one can be as one please one as he pleases the accuracy of this description is borne out in the ease 
with which Chaitanya and his sect obtained space in Vrindavan and received protection and encouragement. An incident of the year 1517 is illustrative of the conditions. On his way from Vrindavan to Priyav, when Chaitanya was, went into a swing by the flute playing of a meat man, a Pathan Bidli Khan at the head of 10 horsemen arrested Chaitanya's uh, companion on suspicion of having drugged the ascetic for the purpose of robbing him. They were released only when on coming back to his senses, Chaitanya himself explained the situation. Bijli Khan and his horsemen were reported to have been impressed by Chaitanya that they, so much that they joined his sect. Even more, even among theologians, a figure like Kabir could elicit admiration. The so orthodox man, as Abdul Haq Muhaddis, writes in his collection of biographies of Muslim saints that Muslim saints, the Akbarul Akhyar, of how his grandfather told his father that monarchies like Kabir were a class apart from both Muslims and Hindus, implying that there could be no disapprobation of them. One must remind oneself that Akbar's childhood was spent practically entirely from infancy to the age of 12 in Kabul. He must uh, where there was a cosmopolitan culture and tradition of the late Timurid uh, Herat prevailing. He must surely have been aware in the, that he was born in the house of a Hindu chief at Amarpur. It was Rana to whom his father left his uh, pregnant wife. Rana Prasad was the one who has who's, who offered his uh, asylum or his uh, say protection to Hamida Banu Begum, where Akbar was born. With his keen interest in history, he might have learned that his father Humayun sought and received help from Shah Tamas, the Shia king of Iran, and perhaps a little later that his grandfather Babur had entertain no qualms about making an alliance against Ibrahim Lodi with Rana Khan. Akbar's early education included lessons in painting, including the art of drawing human portrait under the famous artist Haja Abdul Samad. And um, it hardly mattered that many Orthodox Muslims considered painting to be forbidden. Bayazid, in his memoirs, report Akbar's father, Humayun's enthusiastic patronage of, arts, of art and painting. Such cultural heritage must always be borne in mind when we consider Akbar's latter Catholic attitude towards different cultural streams. But there were also certain important traits specific to Akbar's persons from a very early period whose role cannot be overlooked. Akbar had an enormous amount of curiosity and he wished to know about everything, including what the common people did and how they lived. In the sixth regnal year, that is 1560-61, he went incognito to a popular festival, as was his habit and was engrossed in observing the various actions and modes of behavior of the people present. When he came to be recognized by some people, only by squinting his eyes, squinting by his eyes, was he able to conceal his identity and escape from an embarrassing situation. Rafiuddin Shirazi, a Persian merchant who visited Agra in the early 1560s, narrated a few other incidents of this kind, which occurred during 1562-63. The young emperor at least twice separated himself from the hunting party accompanying him and went alone chasing the prey. Once by not revealing his identity, he allowed himself 
to be imprisoned in a cattle pen by the villagers on another occasion he went alone to an inn or sarai and after being fed by bhatiyaran uh, the the inn keeper women of inn keeper was resting there when a merchant party arrived and taking him for a disrespectful loafer gave him a few lashes and drove him drove him away the few din kim still saw him moving about in a crowd with some companions without ceremony and also publicly flying kites from the roof of the palace in a casual attire it is thus obvious that akbar mingled freely among both hindus and muslims the madiyaran might well have been a hindu if rafiuddin is to be believed he already had a brahman girl as a mistress and his order for forbidding slave trade was attributed to this intelligent human girls please who suggested that once to akbar that if the slaves are imported if the slaves are exported and the horses are imported in place one day he will become the emperor of the horses it is in such circumstances that we can explain one of akbar's earliest farman this was issued in april 1561 to assign a billet in lieu of his salary to ustad ramdas ustad means the master ustad ramdas ramdas that is the a master dyer then another farman was issued in may in may 1562 to give him further land in inam and a third farman in march april 1569 was issued to assist the same ramdas in recovering the sum of rupees certain which he had lent to a certain person who was not ready to return a mere master dyer ramdas the held a jagir assignment well before akbar's meeting with raja bharmal and his marriage to blatter's daughter in january 1562 this is also perhaps the first uh, information or the first instance of a jagir being assigned or a land of the income from a land of fees being assigned in lieu of salary uh it that is so it was here that one finds how the his fear of uh, contacts with the hindus was growing here was here what the vrindavan documents tells us is of much interest in january 1565 akbar issued a farman to grant inam land to the chaitanya priest gopal das at the recommendation of raja bharma Bharma. In October 1568, to their much recommendation, recommendation, a farman was issued to hand over the management or adhikar of the Madan Mohan and Gobind Dev Temple to G. Goswami. And in 1576, a grant was made to Govardhan and other priests upon the proposal of Sir Bas Khan. It is interesting to know that all the grants. in vrindavan the entire pious or the sacred city of vrindavan came up by the grants of uh, or land grants given by akbar to the chaitanya sect and from badanyunis and uh, but one and all the temples were also built up out of this grant so it is also interesting to note that Akbar never visited any of the Vrindavan temples. From Badanjuni, we learned that in 1574, Akbar desired that the Sighasan Bhattisi be translated by Badanjuni, and in 1575-76, he directed the translation of Atharvaeda to be prepared. We can thus see that the abolition of pilgrimage tax and the jizya in 1563-64. was a pattern uh one has also to remember that how the this uh, order king akbar decided after a hunt to walk back to agra and on the way back he found passing through mathra he found the poor 
pilgrimage paying the pilgrimage tax and jizya and immediately reaching the capital he gave the orders for abolition of both the taxes just at the turn of the uh, uh, to a tolerance of hinduism in the early 1560s cannot simply be attributed to a desire to placate the rajput so to a burst fierce campaigning in rajasthan beginning with the storming of chittor in 1568 cannot be made the basis of hypothesizing an orthodox turn in akbar's policy during the late 1560s and a document which is certainly not very reliable and appears on only in one not very authentic collection the munshiyat e namkin the fatha nama chittor can be seen as a change in the uh, in, in hypothesizing a change in a, uh, as an orthodox in akbar's policy during 1560 and the inter interesting thing is that this uh, uh, say the fatanama chittor which is taking which is supposed to be the example or the evidence of akbar's shift in policy uh, was was issued after the victory of chittor which was achieved by the uh, by the help of or by the real assistance of todarmal and bhagwan das so how the two things can be put together that can only be It rather and one can see that that cannot be the fact that it was there was any shift in his policy there is at the same time no reason to believe that a general policy of conciliation with the hindus so hindu subject required akbar to challenge muslim orthodoxy akbar could pray five times a day and visit the ajmer shrine which he did first of all in 1562 Badayuni aptly, uh, aptly described his belief in Islam before the Ibadat Khana discussions as those of a mere ordinary believer, a follower of tradition and custom. Such an attitude would accommodate Timurid culture as well as towards tolerance towards non-Muslims, and it also allow one to issue holy war patanama, as one can. even may believe that it was really issued after the uh, yeah, success at thought why did the religious crisis of the mid 1570 bro break out it seems to me here that what badayuni says has to be given more weight than has hitherto been the case he argues that by the early 1570s akbar had become conscious of the way in which at repeated moments of danger he had been saved by god and of how so many kinds of successes had come his way through his aid he began to retire to a cell to meditate on god which came duly to be called ibadat khana he wished to make some return to god for what boons he had granted him and his this ignited in him an intense desire to serve religion in some decisive way there in some independent confirmation there is some independent confirmation how this feeling in akbar grew one important index in his extraordinary attachment to the ajmer sharif shrine displayed in 1570 from 1570 onwards akbar began to go on pilgrimage to ajmer every year sometimes twice a year in 1574 he went there on foot and in 1576 partly on his visits to ajmer ceased only in 1579 there is therefore much plausibility in badayuni's suggestion that akbar turned to theologians to tell him what he should do to bring into effect the dictates of god that is the sharia this is certainly far more persuasive with this is than abul fazl that the ibadat khana discussion were a deliberate means where akbar like a coin tester 
shifted the bad from the good and also himself laid bare divine truths or haqaiq by his sacred utterances. What Abul Fal suggests is obviously unhistorical, arising out of his theory of how Akbar purpose, purposely conceived his own wisdom in early days. What Abul Fazl held to be Akbar's innate wisdom itself came to be generated in part by Ibadat Khana deliberation. There came about an immense and sincere disillusionment in Akbar with regard to Islamic theology once its various elements began to be discussed by scholars in front of him. Discussions which were turning violent and abusive. On each point, there arose bitter controversy. The differences among the legal schools reached such a point, relates Badayuni, that one party would accuse the other of infidelity and deviation, and the controversy is going beyond the matters of Sunni, Shia, Hanafi, Shafi, Jurist, and rationalists, entered in the core of the principle of the faith. There were also certain difficulties, both personal and political, once Akbar committed himself to the course of implementing the Sharia. In the Timurid family, up till Babar, there had been no limitation on marriage with freeborn women. The senior wives, up to four in number, were called Begums and other Agas. Akbar followed the same custom, though the term Aga went into disuse. In Muslim law, there is a Quranic limitation to for free born wives, though none on concubines. Akbar wished to know whether by some device 9 or 18 free born wives could be permitted, even with muta or contact marriage, there would be difficulty in permitting more than four such wives at one time. Besides these personal embarrassments, the political implications were still severe. In 1575-76, the orthodox leader Sheikh Abdul Nabi and Mahdoum al persuaded Akbar to reimpose Jazia, though like a painting on, it, on water, it soon disappeared as Padayuni tells us. So there were, uh, tells us, and interestingly enough, it was not only um, disappeared, but one must keep in mind that the order for the introduction of the for in reintroducing the jazia was given by todermal whose seal reads todermal bande darga ram ki pana so the duality was still going on there uh, the, so the moment Akbar's views altered the tax was formally withdrawn in 1579 80 Clearly, the difficulty for Akbar lay not only in the manifestation of the huge disagreement among the, among the theologians, but also on what they were agreed on. The farmer could be disposed, uh, disposed of by the measure of 1579, by which the leading scholars at Akbar's court were persuaded into ceding the right of interpretation subject to many conditions to Akbar as a just sovereign. The implication on what the orthodox theologians, theologians were agreed upon were more troubling, for these could be greatly restricted as far as Akbar's own sovereign authority was concerned. It is therefore not surprising that Akbar should not turn to those ideas within Sufi thought which seemed to bypass the Sharia and establish a direct relationship with God. Shahabuddin Maktoum's elimination is theory with its suggestion of the great position of the elect of God and the concept of insani kamil, the perfect man, and the sulekul in the Arabic tradition offered important alternatives. With Akbar, important alternatives, within Islamic thought, which Akbar would now grasp. Sulekul implied that all apparent reality of the world, including religion, was illu an illusion. So religious differences, as indeed all other points of difference, lost their significance 
and all the different faiths should therefore be tolerated to secure mutual amity. But Sulekul by no uh, means exhausted Akbar's new ideological position. There was now to be a special position for reason, Akhir, by whose medium mutual peace could be maintained among all disputants and a hearty elevated place was to be provided for the just sovereign who could be seen as perfect man and God's wise parent for variant for people of all faith to implement, so to speak, the Sulhekul. There was thus a new ideological foundation laid for the Mughal Empire. Now, this uh, new ideas or new say, platform for bringing in reason was also to be reflected in what one see that Akbar started as a social ethics, a new ethics which were to be uh, introduced now by Akbar. And a, on the humanitarian ground, humanitarian notions, which seems to have led him to reject traditional law, just when he was also rejecting traditional religion. So Akbar started some uh, new sort of ethics, which begins with his uh, this uh, making slavery, abolishing slavery. He seems this has seemed uh, seems to have troubled Akbar right from some time. The forcible enslavement was the source of the replenishment of the rank of slaves in India. According to Abul Fazl, Akbar issued an order as early as the seventh regnal year, prohibiting imperial soldiers from making captive the women, children, and kinsmen of the opposing soldiery and then selling them or keeping them as slaves. The emperor is said to have thought that by killing, imprisoning, and whipping the rebels was, a necess was necessary for controlling the country. It was unjust to hurt innocent women and children by way of punishing those rebels. Abul Fazl's further, uh, further statement indicates that this was being currently, that is in 1594, enforced to, per, uh, to protect obedient and that is the revenue paying villages from slave collecting rates by blind blind hearted avaricious ones who would otherwise offer a thousand excuses and call to account. In 1580 Arif Kandahari tells us that Akbar had decreed that no man or woman, minor or adult was to be enslaved and that no concubine or slave of Indian birth was to be bought or sold for this concern, for uh, this concerns of priceless life. He must here be referring to a birth order of 1562-63. His statement also shows that not only enslavement of captives, but sale of slaves as well as pro as well was prohibited. In this, he is strongly corroborated by Rafiuddin Ibrahim Shirazi, a Iranian merchant, who recalled that when he was in Agra in 1563-64, a friend of his sold a slave. The Kotwal of the city, hearing of this, cut off his ear and nailed it to the fort wall as a warning to others. The sale of, say, of slaves and concubines, he added, had been forbidden because Akbar's Brahman mistress had told him that his kingdom was losing nearly two lakhs persons every year to slave trade. In Gujarat, in 1574-75 famines, people offered their children for sale. And one there is another, and there was no way to stop that. The one interesting thing is that Abul Fadl is silent on this decree of Akbar against slave enslavement and slave trade. Possibly 
due to the fact that it was it proved impossible to enforce in enforce it at the time when it uh, it was issued in spite of the measures so such measures as sir rafi din shiraji described for one feminist continuously spawned slaves slaves the problem was that in such type of situations it was the parents who were chasing their or forced to sell their children themselves ralphi said that same for the same reasons for um akbar's empire in kashmir just his fathers found that in a famine ranging there in 1597 many mothers have no means of nourishing their children and expose them for sale in the public place the phenomena raised an ethical question for theology abdul qadir badayuni in his, in his najat e rashid said that selling selling free born person was a reprehensible sin committed by muslims especially in india the same author reports that during the period of baram khas accidency sheikh bahauddin and other theologians at agra have issued a declaration that in condition of acute hunger a person could sell his child but this was deemed to be opposed by main authorities of muslim law and significantly enough abu fazl's father sheikh mubarak had declined to put his seal on akbar's own attitude had been manifest in his original order in 1562-63 where in more realistic terms the order reads that if in times of acute hunger and distress the parents have had to sell their children then when they recover the ability do, to do so they may repay the amount and get their children freed from the yoke of slavery at the same time merchants were required not to take or to, to, to bring horses and take slaves from hindustan the general order to the kotwal of the city the head of the police as recorded in the ayn in 1595 was to allow no one to seize any one person or sell slaves this seems to have been of more comprehensive nature recalling the total prohibition of earlier days though is still obviously impossible of enforcement in times of distress and famines the order however suggests where a person get his leave but danuni written in writing in 1590 put possibly at uh, says that praise we got that these days this practice of selling children has abated some more if this was due in part to akbar's administrative measures it was creditable achievement prohibition of enslavement and slave trade however did not mean to ban ban slavery as an institution the major step that akbar took in this direction was in 1582 he first liberated all his own slave the major was announced by him at an extraordinary meeting of his highest counselors that he convened to discuss what measures of public welfare welfare could be taken by him fortunately we have a detailed account of this abul fazl's in abul fazl's akbar nama abul uh, akbar in freed all his slaves but said that he has he is going to style them as jailers or disciples and a strict order was issued that from now on these victims of forcible capture should not be called slaves it was further ordered that whoever from among these be slave wants to go anywhere has the anywhere has need to do so he who, who decides to stay shall have his wages fixed according to his condition and would be put to some work and will be called or named or designated jela it is difficult to say how much freedom the slave obtained by their metamorphosis into jelas but even if the change was little more than nominal in practice the view of slavery was an un, as an unjust institution is again implicit here in latter years 
around 15 late 97 akbar showed that he is averse to the idea of forced labor as well. when he built the fort in kashmir he he, the, he had a whole inscription on that scene that the this has been built by paying to all it no no forced labor was built so this nagar or srinagar fort was especially on it was especially recorded he also tried to have some restrictions on forced labor in kashmir which was prevalent at that time so one finds that uh, there was all attempts which akbar certainly tried to make in the directions of some social equity and what else one can say. Uh, the, he also has an idea that women should get equal share. And he certainly said that it is rather strange that those who are supposed to be of the weaker sex have in Islamic law half a share instead of having the double. Many of these, many of these ideas are coming forward from his uh, happy scenes where he says that look at the uh, these Hindu men who consider themselves superior to women but consider themselves to be dependent on their salvation, on their wives committing or so say sati. He turned against sati as well and made all attempt to abolish it. This and at one time he himself went at the time while well, the Motaraja's daughter uh, was going to be put to uh, fire and but at the same time, he never wanted to interfere with the beliefs of any religion, particularly the Hindu religion. And therefore, he said that Sati could only be confined to, the, to those women who are freely or by their own option are trying to do it. There should be no uh, enforcement that no one can perform sati, but there should be a full guarantee that it is by the consent of the wife who is going to attend sati. So whether it is slavery, whether it is the uh, share of the um, women in property, on all these matters, Akbar was very uh, careful and was rather belonging to what one may say to the creed of the reformers, uh, which, which can be celebrated. He, he went to that extent uh, criticizing the Islamic law, where in the absence of the sons, the property was to be given to the nephews. And he was much critical of this idea that why women could not get there. At the same time, one finds that Akbar was uh, also having some uh, difficulty in accepting the in whatever type of uh, involved some sort of a class caste differentiation. One may say that on certain aspect he might have the influence of the Hindu practices, but there were some where one finds him rather going much beyond that. There is, however, one passage in Akbar, in Akbar Nama which suggests Akbar's readiness to depart from the ordinary social norms of caste, um, which I would read. On four Bra four, fourth Brahman, Khidmat Raya Mukundi died. He belonged to a caste in India which is approached by none in the realm of crime. It is also known as Mavai or Bavai or Chandal. His majesty treated him kindly and made him head of his caste and with firmness of grasp guided him to rectitude. He opened a part of the door of his heart 
and then by that man's persu uh, persuasions, many of his caste came out of their destructive ways. He further says that today every house keeps them as watchmen. Since he ob obtained the title of Khidmat Rai, all who belong to his caste are now called Khidmatiyas. The Khidmatiyas also figure in the Ainyak Bari where their traditional profession is described as robbery and thievery. It adds that past rulers had not done anything to find a proper remedy for this, which Akbar now provided. It is characteristic of Akbar that, that uh, this regarding all inhibitions of the past, he should make the chief outcast a titled official with the coveted designation of Rai and appoint lowly untouchable as his own palace court. That there is no consistent, let alone comprehensive thrust towards the elimination of social inequities and inequalities in Akbar is only to be expected. As emperor, he presided over a vast system of exploitation and oppression embedded in its regular routine and orderly functioning. But for this very reason, his reputation, repu repudiation of slavery and his demand of larger rights for women cannot be dismissed as mere eccentricities of a genius or despot. There was behind them the impulse of genuine ethical growth. This did not come from a synthesis of religions, which by itself would not have produced such growth. There is here surely an application of reason that was increasingly turning humanitarian. It may indeed well be claimed that in our birth, we see the early flickers of that beauty of traditional India, which would later turn into flame in the Indian Renaissance. Thank you. Sir, uh, Professor Bakshi, you have to unmute yourself. Yes. Professor Musmi has given a very good statement of the and the ethical beliefs of one of the greatest rulers India has ever had, that is Emperor Akbar. I knew about Akbar's curiosity about various religions. He invited the yogis of Akbar to, uh, con to, to be consulted by him. He invited Christians of all faiths. And he himself tried to sort of evolve a religion called Deen Ilahi. But I didn't know that his curiosity extended so far that he would venture out incognito to find out the conditions of the ordinary people and would in fact risk being imprisoned while he is being done, uh, doing so. I knew that he was one of the first rulers in the world to have been saved 150 years before the British forbade it in 1807. And I also knew that he did not encourage Pati at all. But that he also had thought of slaves as victims of circumstances, and he would have actually freed them if he would have be done so. That, that is new to me. It is his abolition of Jizya was motivated both, I think, by <coughs> his. Uh, Believe that all the, the subjects of his realm should enjoy the same kinds of <coughs> privilege under his rule. But I think it was also motivated by a simple desire for efficiency. Because collecting Jizya would have been definitely an intrusive process and would have led to various kinds of corruption at the lower levels. So I'm very grateful to Professor for giving us this case 
of one of the best rulers that India has ever had. Now, if anybody has any questions, please come out to me. There is a question from Mr. Virender Dhilon. He says, Dear Madam, which regions particularly got impacted by Akbar's liberal outlook? Uh, were the regions far away like Kabul, Ahmednagar, and Bengal also affected by his policies in terms of secular and cultural ideas? You know, uh, of course. Uh, whatever be the part of the Mughal Empire that has to be affected by that. But one has also to keep in mind that where the Mughal control of the Mughal Empire was more, was stronger, that would have been benefited more or that could, there could be a more uh, say, vigil on those places. But the laws whichever were made were for the entire uh, country. And we know we have some evidence forthcoming that how in Bengal too, the slaves were freed or slavery was abolished. So Kabul on those places, all the entire Mughal empire was supposed to be because the central administration of the Mughal empire and their control over the all the provinces was quite effective. Any other questions? Ma'am, there is a question that um, you have addressed in your uh, talk, but I'm just uh, uh, mentioning this. Ashwat Bhattacharya says that um, to what extent did conflicts like the Shia Sunni conflict uh, lead to the open Ibadat Khana discussions? You know, Ibadat Khana, I, uh, I would like to be brief because I don't want to eat up in uh, Aditya's time uh, looking at the watch. But as far as the uh, Ibadat Khana discussions were concerned, uh, there was no controversies which were... The Ibadat Khana discussions were of a different type. And the whatever be the discussion, the there was a control by the emperor who was presiding over to those and in the presence of the emperor himself those discussions cannot it was not possible for those to go out of control and the ideas of shias and sunnis and all that i think under in akbar's time those were gone in the background you find all these coming back afterwards because you never think that find that Akbar is going to offer prayers and there is a theory that he has left uh, the Fatehpur Sikri because he built such a domineering uh, mosque that he didn't like it further and he never went back after building that after the change in his religious outlook. So all these, whether it is Shia Sunni, whether it is Hindu Muslim, all that was, was to be subsumed under the Sulhe Kul, where everyone is to be treated at, it, at par and has to retain his personal views to himself. Sir, that is all from, in, from the chat boxes. Okay. Uh, then may I welcome uh, Mr. Aditya Mukherjee, whom I have had the good fortune to know for a very long time. I think most of the historians who have know about his work. It has been concentrated primarily on the independence struggle of, of India. And he has strongly espoused the <coughs> view that most of the persons who engaged in the uh, independence struggle proper had an inclusive view of India. Uh, whether they were liberal or conservative, even somebody like uh, Madan Mohan Malabia or uh, the descendant of a peer like Moulana Abul Kalam Azad had 
very similar views about the what the future of India would be like. And the, the, that future of India was probably the closest, as far as I can make out, to Nehru's kind of view, a liberal socialist view. Although I believe that Aditya has much stronger Marxist leanings, but is in his general view of the Indian struggle, he has given equal credit to those who are liberal, who are liberal without being Marxist. But he has all the time emphasized the idea that uh, whoever participated in the uh, independence struggle had an inclusive view of India with a totally secular view of, of the way in which the country would uh, go forward. And he has kept to the, that view in his also his uh, work on uh, pa uh, partly with uh, Midula on post-independence India. With this few years, words, may I invite Aditya to give his talk now? Thank you very much, Professor uh, Bhakti. Webinar, <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, to begin with, I thank Professor Mahalakshmi, Mr. Congress, for this webinar. I'm thankful and honored that she is chairing Guru Professor Irfan Habib. Is, I'm honored that he's just, I speak today less student of history and citizen deeply disturbed at the I'm sorry, the connection got lost for a moment. As I said, some of the questions that I shall ask are the following. What were the values that went into the imagination of the Indian nation? What Rabindranath Tagore called the idea of India. Where were these values drawn from? Why was it able to capture the minds and hearts of the vast multitudes of an extremely diverse Indian people, despite powerful counters posed to it? How was the Indian imagination of what values should constitute the nation different from other imaginations of a nation? Lastly, what I will not deal with is in today's talk is why and how these values are under severe threat today. But what one hopes to do is that through a proper understanding of the values of our national liberation struggle, one of the biggest mass movements in world history, and its deep roots will give us the hope, the courage, the wherewithal to fight the evil which is looming so large over our country. An evil which threatens to wipe out that something which was vital and evolving, vital and enduring in Indian civilization, about which Nehru spoke so poetically in the discovery of India. Nehru said, India could not have continued a cultural existence for thousands of years if she had not possessed something very vital and enduring, something that was worthwhile. What was that something? Nehru asks. You know, it reminds you of Iqbal. Kuch baat hai ki hasti milti, mitti nahi hamari. Despite centuries of turmoil. Uh, Nehru seeks the answer 
for this in his discovery of India. And he pours over the long Indian history from the ancient past to the medieval period to the recent years. And he's trying to find an answer to enable him to find the inspiration for creating the struggle to counter the destruction of all that India stood for that was occurring under colonialism. It is quite amazing, actually, that how Nehru writing from prison in the 1940s raises so many of the questions that Professor Rifan Habib raised today from precisely looking at this huge uh, canvas of Indian civilization from the uh, Harappan civilization till the 19th and the 20th century. I shall return to this aspect of Nehru's inquiry into the past and his, what he finds in the India's cultural past a little later. I shall first very briefly talk out the values which were enshrined in the idea of India, the vision that went into the making of the modern Indian nation, values which formed the basis of our constitution after independence. This was a vision that was shared across a very wide spectrum of the Indian national movement. It was not Nehru's or Gandhi's idea. It was not one section of the national movement and the other. This idea of India that we are talking about was shared by the moderates, the extremists, the Gandhians, the socialists, the communists, the revolutionaries, everybody, except, of course, the communalists and the loyalists. And it is this, the basic conception of that idea I'll lay out for you. There were, of course, differences on several other issues, but the, on these basic uh, conceptions, the vision, there was an agreement. But one, of course, that of sovereignty and anti-imperialism, that India would be a free country, it would not become a junior partner to any country, and nor would it subjugate others after independence. And it would, in fact, fight for the freedom of others. These are all sort of very uh, dear ideas to most leaders of the Indian national movement. And second, and extremely important in today's context, context was democracy. From a very early period, I mean, as early as the 19th century, late 19th century, Tilak is talking of adult franchise before it becomes uh, common parlance in the rest of the world. Hmm? He's talking of adult fran franchise. He's talking of each citizen irrespective of class, caste, religion, gender, color, race, language, having an equal right in the decision making of the country. I may digress a bit here because since the NRC and the CAA uh, has raised so many issues about who's an Indian citizen, and since being a contemporary historian, I cannot resist keep referring to what is happening right under our noses. I will simply quote to you what Gandhiji had to say about this, about who is a citizen of India. And then I shall return to the general discussion that we are having. Gandhiji said in 1942, when he was told that he was deeply disturbed by reports coming in, the RSS was using slogans like saying that Hindustan belongs to Hindus and no one else and drive out the English and then we shall subjugate the Muslims. And if they do not listen, we shall kill them. This report comes to Gandhiji and in response to this, on 9th August, very interestingly, 9th August 1942, he writes, Hindustan belongs to all those who are both, who are born and bred here and have no other country to go to. Therefore, it belongs to Parsis, to Bani Israelis, to Indian Christians, to Muslims, to other non-Hindus. He mentions every small community that he can think of, as much as to Hindus. Free India will be no Hindu Raj. It will be an Indian Raj based not on the majority of any religion or sect or community, but on the representatives of the whole people without distinction of any religion. Democracy for the Indian national movement 
was not going to be only in words or an objective, but was to be practiced while pursuing the movement itself. Important decisions in the movement were based on open discussion and debate and open expression of those uh, uh, differences. The, for example, the decision to start the non-cooperation movement in 1920 in Calcutta was taken after open debate and voting. And uh, about 1886 people voted for and 884 voted against Gandhiji's resolution. Yeah, even more uh, stark example is when Gandhiji, uh, on Gandhiji's resolution condemning the bomb attack on the Viceroy's train, uh, that resolution was challenged and was passed by a narrow margin of 942 for and 794 against. Democracy also meant for the Indian national movement dissent and respect for the opposite view. It also meant civil liberties and a free place, free press being completely non-negotiable. And this was true, this was argued from Ramon Roy, Tilak, Gandhi, Nehru. I mean, it, this was a constant refrain that civil liberties, the right of dissent uh, must be respected. Uh, the best example of this perhaps is when 13 communists, members of the AICC voted against the Quit India Resolution. But, a movement which galvanized the whole country. You can imagine the huge enthusiasm and 13 communists in the AICC opposed the resolution. Gandhiji clearly protect, to protect the communists who took a position which could have, which could cause much popular discord. At the beginning of his do or die speech says, I congratulate the 13 friends who voted against the resolution. In doing so, they had nothing to be ashamed of. For the last 20 years, we have tried to learn not to lose courage, even when we are in a hopeless minority of one, and we are laughed at. It behoves us to cultivate this courage of conviction, for it ennobles man and raises his moral stature. I was therefore glad to see that these friends had imbibed the principle which I have tried to follow in the last 50 years and more. So this aspect of the national movement, and particularly Gandhiji, is perhaps it is this what led Lenin to call Gandhi a revolutionary. The fact that he brought the people into action, the masses of people into action, and that he did not prevent they being mobilized to any other further more revolutionary uh, movements. It is important to remember the distinction, sorry, excuse me. To, to return to the, uh, the basic constituents of the idea of India after democracy, the third major element was secularism. In fact, it emerges from democracy itself. At that time, the term democracy and secular were used coterminously. You talked of secular democracy. There cannot be a democracy without secularism. And there could not be a secularism without democracy. And uh, so this was a very, very important part of the uh, of the common consensus, as I said, from the right to the left of uh, Indian, Indian nationalists. And lastly, there was a consensus on a pro-poor orientation. Not necessarily socialist, though, though that view was increasingly becoming stronger and stronger after the 1920s, but there was nevertheless a, a consensus on a pro-poor orientation from the moderate Nara, Dadabai Naroji days. If you look at the writings of Naroji, Dath, so in the Banerjee, you find that the poor are very much in the center of their inquiry, down to Nehru and then to, of course, Gandhi and his focus towards the, the Taridna Narayan, the socialists and the communists. This, I'd very briefly like to mention, was a very brave and unique imagination of a nation and nationalism in sharp contrast to how modern nation states were being imagined elsewhere in the world. European national states, as they emerged, you know, 
they emerged as homogenous units one language one religion catholic france italy the unification of italy the unification of germany so one language one uh, religion and uh, what was was the mode the french revolution actually flattened out france france was a multilingual country and was made into a one language country the indian imagination was on the other hand exactly the opposite it would celebrate diversity multiple cultures multiple languages were seen as complementary not contradictory to each other the best urdu poet the best bengali literature the best telugu reformer the best tamil poet were also the best nationalists they were complementary the second difference was that the european nation states nation states as we know emerged with the rise of capitalism and inherent in the rise of capitalism was the rise of imperialism and colonialism these these two processes almost occurred simultaneously so there was in that conception of nationalism an aggrandizing a dominating element an element which was absent in the indian vision of nationalism it was liberating it was humanist it was anti imperialist the reason why i mention this at this time is because it is impo- important to remember this distinction between these two nationalism in our times because it is this european vision which unless checked by radical movements as it was in many many countries in europe it ended up in its logical conclusion of the hitlers and the mussolinis and it is this alien vision of a narrow single homogenous aggressive aggrandizing nationalism which is now being masqueraded as the genuine indian nationalism and who's masquerading it it is being masqueraded by what we would call the fake nationalists nationalists those who were not part of the indian national movement who fell out of the spectrum which believed in the idea of india who in fact sided with the colonial uh, authorities moving on to the question where were these values where were the values propagated by the national movement over nearly 100 years where were they drawn from the values of democracy freedom reason rationality scientific temper tolerance secularism etc no longer the eurocentric view can be sustained that these values emanated in europe during the enlightenment because of some innate qualities that europe possessed the kind of argument which professor bartzi has demolished so successfully in a, in 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 many of his writings that view cannot be held that it emanates in europe and the rest of the world was to follow uh, and learn from this in fact this eurocentric view of the spread of enlightenment was used became the intellectual and ideological justification of imperialism the civilizing mission the europe has acquired this truth and it will now civilize the rest of the world by transmitting it transmitting it to them it is time to recognize that there were globally alternate routes to modernity i am very fond of citing the german historian dietmar rothermund rothermund in this context where he contrasted two emperors who ruled for roughly 40 years as early as the 16th century that is a few centuries before uh, the european enlightenment akbar of india and philip the 2 of spain akbar talking of reason rationality tolerance universal peace freedom of thought rights of women he in fact as as we heard organizes institutional debates in which various religious thinkers and even atheists were invited he promotes the the sufi chishti tradition of non violence etc and on the other hand you have philip the 2 doing the spanish inquests where tens of thousands were killed uh, for committing religious heresy indian nationalists undoubtedly drew from the powerful trends globally emanating from european enlightenment including 
the rising left and Marxist thinking that emerged in the world. But they also drew from India's past. They drew from India's tradition of reason, humanism, uh, tolerance, science, etc., and tried to establish a historical linkage with it. And in so doing, gave a distinct character to the Enlightenment project that occurred in the Indian situation. I would come back to the to this towards the end of my talk that by linking up with with the, with the, uh, the the manner in which the future was invented was definitely uh, determined uh, affected. Jawaharlal Nehru, as I said earlier, makes a conscious effort to link with the past in his discovery of India. I'll very briefly bring to your attention some of what he draws from India's history. He was not a professional historian. I'm sure on many counts he may be wrong. But from what I heard today, on many counts, he seems to have got the essence of what what needed to be got out of Indian history. But let me give you a quick uh, purview as I read through the discovery of India uh, for while, while preparing today's talk. It was absolutely a fascinating experience. Beginning with the Indus Valley civilization, he calls it a predominantly secular civilization, where the religious element, though may be present, did not dominate. He contrasts it with Egypt and Mesopotamia, where he says there were magnificent temples for the gods and lavish palaces were built, while the people had to content, uh, be content with mud dwellings. In the Indus Valley, he says, the picture is reversed. The finest structures were created for the convenience of citizens. Following the eclipse of, the, of this civilization, Nehru says there came the Aryans from Central Asia, the Iranians, the Greeks, the Parthians, the Bactrians, the Scythians, the Huns, the Turks before Islam, the early Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians, and later the Muslims. And he says, and he says, sums it up. He says they came, they made a difference, and they were absorbed. He repeatedly points out that the word Hindu does not appear in ancient times. And its use in relation to a particular religion was of a very late occurrence. He says the old inclusive term for religion was Arya Dharma or Dharma, which meant more than a religion, which meant a moral ethical code. It included the Vedic, non-Vedic, Buddhist, Jainic. When, when you, the Dharma included everybody at that time. He, liked, he highlights the eternal questioning from the very early times, as Professor Habib pointed out in the Rig Veda, he refers back to the creation hymn, and he and he notes uh, the lack of dogma, the questioning of the Creator itself, the element of a scientific method, the general tendency towards monism, which he says is perhaps intended to lessen the sharp differences that must have existed, a tendency towards synthesis an opposition to magic, the supernatural, rituals, ceremonies, etc. He quotes, he who sees the one spirit and all, and all in one, all in one spirit, henceforth can look with contempt at no creature, on no creature. Overall, he says, an atmosphere of tolerance, reasonableness, free thought in matters of faith, and the desire and capacity to live and let live, outlined this situation. He notes the existence of the notion of sacrifice and restraint, tapasya, being necessary for achieving knowledge or good. As we know, Gandhiji resonated with this idea. In the epics Ramayana and Mahabharat, which Nehru notes and says, which remain unparalleled, unparalleled in terms of exercising a pervasive and continuous influence till the present on the mass, mass mind, he, which caters to a very large population. He says, the epics make us understand somewhat, somewhat the secret of the old India, 
old Indian in holding together a variegated society, divided up in many ways, graded in castes, in harmonizing their discords and giving them a common background or heroic tradition and ethical living. They tried to build up a unity of outlook among the people which was to survive and overshadow all diversity. In the Mahabharat, particularly Nehru says, there is an urge to seek unity in complexity, a term that Sister Nivedita used when she read the Mahabharata, and that, that was one of the first things that she said was, was uh, visible to an outsider. Hmm? He says, in Mahabharata, there is the tendency to absorb old traditions and deal with the new. The basic approach seems to have been that there could be no monopoly on truth. And there were many ways of seeing and approaching it. And this is a constant theme, as we will find that through Indian history, that there are multiple truths, there are many ways of approaching the truth. So all kinds of different and even contradictory beliefs were tolerated. The, I mean, it's not, it's not surprising, therefore, that you know, we, we can even speak of having 300 Ramayanas, hmm? because there, there was, it appears, for a very long period, this uh, openness to alternate views. So he says, the dharma advocated in the Mahabharata and in Gita spoke of the adherence to the basic principles such as truth and non-violence. Thou shalt not do to the other what is disagreeable to thyself. The message, to the, Gita, the message of the Gita, he says, was non-sectarian and addressed to all groups and, uh, and, with, and which made it universally acceptable widely. Nehru goes on to outline the scientific breakthroughs. He talks of various seats of learning from Taxila to Nalanda, but he makes a special mention, which is interesting for us today, of uh, the, the institution of learning in Banaras, where he says there were numerous groups consisting of a teacher and disciples consisting of one teacher and, and, and many disciples, among whom, among these groups, there would be fierce debate and argument. So this tradition of argument and debate in an institutional, institutionalized form in the education system. Nehru then goes on to Buddhism and Jainism, which he calls, which he calls breakaways from the Vedic religion, which both of which, he says, lay emphasis on non-violence. Buddha, he says, attacks superstition, priestcraft, appeals to logic, to reason, to ethics, and does not recognize caste in his own order. He preaches, he's quoting, the poor and the lowly, the rich and the high, all are one. All castes unite in this religion as do the rivers in the sea. The message, he says, is universal benevolence, love to all. Never in the world does hatred cease by hatred. Hatred ceases by love. Let a man overcome anger by kindness, evil by good. You can see the links that at least Gandhi drew from this. And in the line of the openness that I just now spoke of, seen in the earlier tradition, which Nehru keeps uh, referring to, Buddha tells his disciple, I have given you a handful of truths. But besides these, there are many thousands of other truths, more than that can be numbered. This recurring theme, as I said, is, was very significant, and I shall return to it later. I'll, I don't have so much time, but Nehru goes on to speak about Ashoka. I mean, he is he places Ashoka like Professor Habib did in uh, in you know in great respect, and uh, he talks about how he spreads Buddha's ideas and on violence. Then he goes on to speak of the Indo-Afghan, Turkish, and Mughal rule, which he called Indo-Mughal rule, because he said the Afghan rulers like the Mughals integrated into India and received India as their homeland. In, in, you know, in great respect. With these new influences and, uh, coming, he talks once about again, Nehru sees the process of violence coming in. 
Any goes on to speak of the Indo-Afghan, Turkish, and Mughal rule, which he calls the Indo-Mughal rule. He talks because he said the Afghan rulers, like the Mughals, and says this integrated into India and the East India was their homeland by. Rulers themselves. These new influences coming. Really talks Once again, Nehru sees the process of the violence coming in. Then he goes on to speak of the, the, the Indo-Mughal rule, the which he calls Indo-Mughal rule. He talks because he said the Mughal rulers like the Mughals and says this effort since the East India was their homeland. Then he goes on to speak of the Indo-Mughal rule, which he calls Indo-Mughal rule. He talks because he said the Mughal rulers like the Mughals and says this integrated into India and the homeland. Then he goes on to speak of the Indo-Mughal rule, which he calls Indo-Mughal rule. He talks because he said the Mughal rulers like the Mughals and says this integrated into India and the homeland. Then he goes on to speak of the Indo-Mughal rule, which he calls then he goes on to speak on the Indo-Mughal Mughal rule, which he calls the Indo-Mughal rule. He talks because he says the Afghan rulers were like the Mughals and says this integrated into India and the East India was their homeland. By rulers and governments, he talks about once again the process of violence coming in. Then he goes on to speak on the Indo-Mughal rule, which he calls the Indo-Mughal rule. He talks because he says the Afghan rulers were like the the Mughal and says this the 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 Mughal rulers were like the Mughals and says this integrated into India and their homeland. Once again, there is all the idea that the violence coming in. The Mughal rulers were like the Mughals and says this integrated into India and their homeland. The Mughal rulers were like the Mughals and says this integrated into India and their homeland. The Mughal rulers were like the Mughals and says this integrated into India and their homeland. And this 800-year-old tradition continues in the Punjab area. This tradition is very much rooted in much of the century earlier. It is much more rooted in the Punjab area. The Punjab area is very rich in history. By these things, such examples can be prepared of most of the many countries. And this 800-year-old tradition continues in the Punjab area. This tradition is very much rooted in much of the century earlier. Yes, <laughs> 
He points out how Lahore and Sanskrit you find far more questioning than you find in other with the different texts. He points out how Lahore and Sanskrit talks about the medieval you reading, find far more you also questioning than on Akbar. you find in other with the different texts. He points out how Lahore and Sanskrit the medieval you find far more questioning than on Akbar. You find in other with the different texts. He points out how in other words. add that the scientific historical evolution of the indian civilization was not simply an aid not simply something to be utilized by gandhi nehru and our national liberation struggle for struggling to promote a transition to modernity that is to bring about modern democratic values that had emerged globally it was not to be used as as just an aid to bring about these values it was perhaps more than that it may have had a very important role content and manner of the nation making process that occurred in india the content and manner of our transition to modernity the absence of a notion of transcendental truth there being there being the acceptance of the fact that there there is the potential of and the possibility of multiple truths and multiple paths to the seeking of truth in the indian tradition kept the door open for a dialogical tradition and of living with difference and most importantly it kept the the avenue open for non violence and the ethic of reconciliation it is only when you have the notion of having the final truth the ultimate truth the transcendental truth that you may wish to obliterate the other often violently believing that in so doing you are doing ultimate good but if you do not have the notion that you have the ultimate truth then it is very very difficult to be violent in fact i believe that gandhi's non violence emerged from this philosophical position rather than just from its practical applicability in the political situation that india faced the enlightenment project globally often faltered on this ground where this notion of possessing the ultimate truth often justified mass murder negating a critical aspect of democracy itself the critical aspect of the enlightenment project itself witness the destruction that followed the great and heroic the french the russian and the chinese revolutions the means used to achieve the ends distorted in many ways the end in itself the indian national revolution was achieved fortunately without this denouement gandhi drew from this tradition the, the notion of the possibility of alternate truths and the consequence and as a consequence his insistence on non violence 
for him one could only search for truth there was no given final truth he, he could he could you could only be in search for the truth even religion hinduism for gandhi was a search for truth and a search for truth that too by non violent means truth he said was god and even a non believer in search of truth could call himself a hindu so he described a hindu in a very 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 typically i would say ancient indian manner indeed non violence remained the broad consensus at least in practice if not in theory throughout the indian indian national movement it's a very brief uh, episodes this remained the consensus adopting this nation making course non violent nation making course based on the ethic of reconciliation perhaps enabled the indian effort to make this transition to modernity to be less painful and more in tune with the enlightenment objectives than was achieved in the west the second aspect this is an argument which has been very brilliantly made uh, by uh, a scholar a philosopher historian called tad ferney the second aspect of india's civilizational history that of the ability to live with difference accommodation ability to adjust resolve transform rather than crush difference played a major role in the indian national movement's imagination of celebrating diversity that is the fact that the national movement was not forced towards homogenization was very much part of this this uh, civilizational heritage and here too the indian experiment at transition to modernity and nation making had something valuable to offer to the rest of the world <clears throat> it is this great civilizational heritage on which was based one of the most powerful and innovative liberation struggles which became a model for scores of other struggles from the american civil rights movements to the african anti apartheid movement to the polish solidarity movement to the arab spring in recent years it is this which is which gandhi ji called the soul of india which is under grave threat today and it appears that the reserves of this civilization its genius is at test a test the country can scarcely afford to fail thank you Uh, professor bagchi you need to unmute yourself please okay uh, thank you very much aditya there are many takeaways from what you have said and i agree with you practically all of it uh, uh, the takeaways that i had from there are uh, the stress on civil liberty in every uh, uh, person who had struggled for indian independence uh, there is a, a uh, an article by ms hazer where he said that what the nazis did in uh, auschwitz or uh, belsen was something that the colonialists had already done in the countries that they ruled and before ms is a in fact tagore had in his uh, great novel gora shown how the british had trampled on the civil liberties of both the rich and the poor both on the uh, poor villagers and uh, on gora who had come to assist them that's one very important part the second one that i found very fascinating and that is something some completely new to me is gandhi's stress on democracy within the congress party that every decision was taken 
on the basis of voting and generally Gandhi won because of his obviously political astuteness and wisdom, but he tolerated dissent to the extent that when the communists did not support the 1942 resolution, he did not condemn them. This is also something new to me. That kind of tolerance was, could only come from a very great man like Gandhi. And the third takeaway, which I also know, uh, is, uh, is that uh, wh whoever struggled for uh, India's independence had necessarily had to have a secular idea. Because without secularism, you could not have uh, united people of all faiths, all languages, all ethnicities. <coughs> and here, the contrast that you cited from Rothermund is very interesting. The contrast between Akbar and Philip II. But I'd also put the contrast between Akbar and Queen Elizabeth I, who, whose great enemy was uh, Philip II. Elizabeth was also strongly and violently Protestant. Under her rule, the Catholics were more or less uh, disenfranchised. They are jailed uh, unless they could uh, change their religion and so on. And the fourth one is that with the rise of uh, the capitalist nation states, there was a, uh, also a, an aggrandizement this is, this is not to be true in the case of Britain and the Netherlands. They became fiercely uh, imperialist and colonialist countries from the time they became capitalist. But this was true in the case of the Italian city-states also. With Venice, with Genoa, with Florence, they are all initially uh, not only capitalist, but also colonialist either directly conquering islands in the Aegean or uh, uh, conquering uh, uh, Sicily or uh, imposing a kind of indirect rule on the uh, countries with which they traded. So I am taking away all these very important uh, uh, points from your speech. And may I also point out that uh, long before the, Discovery of India, Tagore had written a poem called Bharat Titha, where, where he said that uh, uh, where all the uh, uh, invaders have come and marched with the Indian people, the Hans, the Shakas, the Mughals, the Pathans, and so on. So I think you have given again a very uh, uh, interesting idea of how the Indian civilization concept informed the national struggle. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Professor Patsy. Thank you so much, sir. We have a few questions for um, uh, Professor Mukherjee. Can I read them? Please. Yeah. Uh, one uh, from Shashwat Bhattacharya. There are two questions from him uh, where he says, how can we define the term Bengal Renaissance? Do we need to see it as the impact of Western thought or can we see it separately or is it just a misnomer? And the second point he raises is, can we say the Hinduism emerging in the latter half of the 19th century was a selective Hinduism, which is selecting the elements of Hinduism according to its needs? Yeah, as for the first, I'm, firstly, I'm not an expert in either of these two areas. Huh? I'm not an expert on what I talk, talked about, as Professor Bhakti told, told you in the very beginning, economic history is my area. But from whatever little I know, I, I would say that the Bengal Renaissance is, as uh, was mentioned by Professor Habib as well, that it also draws, and I try to argue that the Bengal Renaissance also draws from past Indian tradition, as, as it does from the West. One of the enduring qualities of, again, the Indian civilizational values has been its openness to the world. As again, Sen has pointed out in his work that, in fact, in the periods of openness were the periods of greatest scientific breakthroughs, the greatest advancement in ideas, etc. And the periods when there were there was an inward 
looking closed mindedness for the periods of decline the bengal renaissance period is a is a period of open endedness where as as i understand they picked up from the rest of the world but they also and ramon roy is a very good example that he writes his earliest work on the basis of his arabic and persian knowledge rather before he is even familiar with english and french etc so you know there is this combination of the two and that is what makes it so remarkable and the two key examples like people like keshav chandra sen and I, others i mentioned are examples of people who draw from the tradition as well and the second question about uh, hinduism in the late 19th century yes as nehru pointed out uh, you know the, the word hindu did not exist the notion of hindu as a religion is a very recent one and even the to give you an example the uh, 1901 census is an example of the continuity of this this synthetic tradition lists in the western region thousands of people just in one region in the bombay presidency hmm? thousands of people who when they were asked what was their religion they said they were hindu muslims or they said they were muslim hindus you know so this notion of being a hindu and by hindu meaning one homogeneous unit is a very recent one and certainly the colonial period is the period when when it is when it is made into one they force you into one or the other just as the just as in the first in the 1880s census in punjab when the peasant was asked what are you he would name his village he would say i am a longowal or i am a phalana or i am a, you know he would name his village then they insisted no what is your religion so he said they would say i am a hindu sikh and they said how can this be so they said okay then i am a sikh hindu they said how can that be you have to choose between the two you see so this this is where something very new is happening the emergence of an identity of this narrow identity of hinduism that you are talking about definitely emerges in the late 19th century are there any questions in any more uh, i think uh, there are no other questions for professor mukherjee but if professor mukherjee will permit there is a question to her uh, about akbar sulekul and guru nanak's philosophy if there is any uh, connection between the two and i thought maybe she would like to comment on that ma'am uh, you have to unmute yourself please well she's doing that adab to saira ji professor uh, muswi you have to unmute yourself please ma'am we cannot hear you ma'am because your mic is switched off you have to press that mic icon which is in red yes ma'am the icon was not coming up so i couldn't do that now i yes uh, i think uh, not only the thinking of guru nanak alone but the entire sikh tradition is quite in line with what akbar was so i fully agree with that that akbar's ideas to get stem are present in the teachings of the guru granth sahib and uh, thank you tomorrow morning i said i asked you yes thank you ma'am uh i think professor bagchi is on a call as he'll just be back Professor Bakchi can you please unmute yourself and 
Um, Professor Musvi has answered, so we finished with the question answer session. Okay, I have gained a lot from all the speakers about the nature of Indian civilization, about its continuity, about the its diversity, about the dialogical uh, uh, tradition that uh, has come down from the time of, let us say, the debate between Lokayat, Charbak, and the Brahmanical streams of the what was at that time called Sanatana Dharma and the uh, the continuity from Ashok to Akbar, continuity from Akbar to uh, the kind of future that Indian uh, uh, freedoms, uh, uh, the people participating in the freedom movement uh, uh, had, an, had the ideology and the uh, well, hope that the this tradition of diversity will survive the people who are trying to uh, bulldoze everything into a mold of, of exclusivity and aggrandizement for a few people. And I hope that the Indian History Congress, which has all the time carried on this tradition of using history as, a, as also a tool for the advancement of the uh, uh, conditions of ordinary people, keeping the minds of people free from superstition and false beliefs. This will be carried on by the Indian History Congress in future also. Thank you so much, Professor Bhakti. Uh, it is my pleasant duty to thank uh, Professor Irfan Habib for the inaugural address. Um, which set the ball rolling really uh, as far as the scope of uh, the study or reflection on Indian civilization is concerned. And uh, I would like to thank Professor Shireen Musvi and Professor Aditya Mukherjee for their, uh, for their presentations, for the way in which they, uh, they reflected on um, on themes related uh, to the the theme of the seminar of the webinar, uh, I'd like to thank Professor Amir Bakchi for chairing this uh, session for his comments, uh, very deep um, comments uh, which which uh, highlighted the major issues raised by each of the uh, scholars who presented today. Um, I really thank you, sir, for that. Um, I would like to um, uh, to uh, inform the members that we did have some glitches in between. I apologize for that. We ourselves are learning this new format. This technology is, uh, is something that we are slowly uh, being initiated into. Uh, I request you to please bear with us. Uh, we have tried our best to resolve issues such as uh, the problems that came up in terms of audio and live streaming and so on. Uh, I thank you all once again, the participants uh, who have uh, patiently listened to our speakers, who have posed their questions. Uh, and I'm sure that you uh, will continue to reflect on some of the ideas that have been raised here. And you can, of course, bring your questions if you have any uh, tomorrow. We begin the session at 10 a.m. tomorrow, and I request all of you to kindly be there and to make this whole program a success. Thank you very much.